Oh, yeah, this is another series that we have to introduce, which is so pivotal for playoffs and actually not just playoff positioning, but getting in the playoffs. Both of these players, Puffy Paw playing as the Malian spawning in on the south side of the map that looks like Dry Arabia to me. And, oh, no, this is Regions, I think. And Lenok playing as the English in the color blue spawning in the north. Now, Malians versus English, this is not a matchup that there is a lot of... There's not. This is a matchup where I don't really see very often, you know? But Malians versus English, historically, Longbowman proved to be pretty good against the Malians, believe it or not. Yep. Uh, anyways, Regents. Interesting map. But that's that's pretty much all I have to say about it. <laughs> oh, I absolutely <laughs> love this map. Let's just take a look at the way Regents actually spawns for people, whether you're new to the map itself or new to this particular tournament those three gold veins that you panned over to in the middle of the map are so so important especially for a malian player who wants to get pit mines and wants to get very very uh scrumptious pit mines let's call them that because of how many houses <laughs> and mining camps you can get around there and then looking at the regions on the western and the eastern side obviously you have berry bushes to the east you have the deer over to the west which are pivotal food areas if you're not playing the English, because when you are playing the English, you just make farms and you don't really care about the map. Somewhat. Somewhat. I, the, yeah, that is a hyperbolization. Uh, yes, English, of, of course it is. Um, I mean, what's really weird about this map is that some, uh, like I've talked to a couple of people, right? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, because there's so few resources, there's no trade markets, there's, there's not a lot of resources on the map. Somehow these fight these maps still catch up to like an hour long drawn out games because you're fighting so much on the middle you're constantly just throwing um for lack of a better word at each other and and, and just nothing sticks and you're just not able to get anywhere. But yeah, I mean this is honestly this map I al I also think it's a very good English map for that particular reason right because this is an open map. You know, it's not necessarily something that English you would think an English would be good at. So things like Altai was a really good English map because of the way the mountain rangers they created that natural choke point mm -hmm. in the middle of the map. For this, it's kind of like the gold mines do that in oh, yeah. regions. So for English, one of the things that they love to do is they'll get up, you know, they'll make sure their feudal age is okay. They'll get their town centers, you know, they'll get their king's palace. They get up to imperial. They have their farm economy all you have the fields of those English fields of wheat just coating the rest of the map. And then what they'll do in Imperial is just consistently spam, you know, things like men at arms or whatever out of their 20 barracks and just set a waypoint for the middle of the map. And you're like, I'm just going to do this forever. I can hit this W key for days. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if spamming W. I still have like that clip in my head of Beastie when he was playing HRE and he just like spams his head against the keyboard and he just wins us the HRE. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. Yeah, clip. that was a good age old. That was a good age old trope for the HRE. You could drag your face across the keyboard and end up picking up a couple games. Uh, but uh, this one, as the English, sometimes in the English and Imperial Age, it feels that way. Sorry to all the English mains out there, but are in you, Imperial Age, it is quite frustrating to play against you, and I hope you are aware of that. Are you really sorry? No, no, oh, that's what I thought. <laughs> so, for now, though. It's kind of just, uh, we're kind of just vibing, just chilling, not too much action. P Lenok will be making a couple of longbows, see if we can pressure the Malians just a little bit. We'll see what Puppypod does here, though. I would expect just spamming javelin throwers, because that is a really good unit against the English. Yeah, it's one of those units, I mean, when it comes Ooh. to javelin throwers, Obviously, they're going to be good against Longbowmen, but Longbowmen don't necessarily have the mobility like other archers do to really get out of harm's way. And I know it's just a 0.1 tile difference, but you can feel how slow they are mm. when you're playing with Longbowmen. Javelin throwers are also one of the slowest units on land, but have the capability to make those Longbowmen back all the way up. Now, Lenok, again, we talked about, we talked about the friskiness of the last series, Cow. And we're adding game one with a just a healthy dose 
of friskiness because Leenock is putting a tower right in front of that first pit mine. Yeah, and I mean, we, we can talk about the maps one a little bit more, right? It's like a couple of towers here and suddenly the Poppy Pot just doesn't have any gold left. Like, he will have the pit mines, sure, but he needs to move all the way to the middle of the map where, well, the English will definitely be control controlling already. So Yeah, this is really important, and I think Leenock is playing playing this strategy so very well. There is no way for the Malians to actually take out that Leenock villager. To, so that outpost is guaranteed 100% to go up. Those houses, just because of that, are almost 100% guaranteed to go down. Yeah. Honestly, I would just pull... I feel, if I was Poppy Pie, I would sacrifice these guys to take down the villager. And at least, like, at least you buy yourself a little bit of time to get the gold income. Not get the, the attack speed boost. That is pretty big. And, uh... Well, at least just give yourself a little bit of room, because now you have a thorn in your side that is so annoying to have to deal with. Oh, it's unbelievably frustrating, yeah. The English do such a good job of doing that. Now, there is another gold mine a little bit to the south of that outpost, if you want to pan down there just a little bit, where another pit mine is going to be built by Puppy Paw. But just because of that outpost, they are going to see it. And the Malians with their javelin throwers are just trying to make sure that villager gets preserved to get a little bit of that passive income. And Leenok knows if he's able to disrupt this passive income by Puppy Paw, it gives him a little bit of more time to not only continue to put his foot on the gas and be a little bit more aggressive in Feudal Age, but it'll mean he can get to Castle Age a little bit unscathed as well. Yeah, we gotta talk about the javelin throwers as well, right? Because if you do deny this gold that is forward, it's gonna be really rough to be making javelin throwers. You will have some income to make like two a minute, maybe like four a minute with all this income that you have right now. But we can actually see Puppy Paw is moved out onto the pit mine here and he's just pulled so many villagers and he's like, I'm getting all the gold I can right now. And it's, you can push me off gold if you want to, but I have the gold for a while. Yeah, it's even with this outpost, you. It begs the question if the outpost position was 100% optimal. You know, if you were able to get that outpost in between both of these gold mines, maybe it could have been a little bit more disruptive to Puppy Paw and the Malians in general. But I'm really enjoying how Puppy Paw is, is actually changing his game plan a little mm. bit. You see a lot of those Malian villagers that are on berries right now. It's not something that they necessarily want to be collecting. They're more of a red meat aficionado than berry bushes but you don't really have the ability to get the cows that you need to start doing the cattle ranches so he's just playing to what he's been given to try to make sure that he's able to not only consider his gold in income continue his villager production i think he's doing the best he can of a bad situation for sure and uh we haven't really seen linux base here but he's going up with that second town center now He's going to get that eco, and usually we talk about, like, how... I mean, we talked about this in the last series as well, right? How the Malians, like, yeah, you can 2TC boom behind it, but it still doesn't match the economy of the Malian cow boom. But when you go to town center and there is no cow boom, you're pretty happy. So right, it seems pretty good, so right? And at that first cow just coming out, um, you could say hi to your brother as he walks to the west looking for a ranch to call home as i'm sure you are as well when you're not casting but with that second town center no. from leenock it'll give him the ability just because there's no military production out of leenock's side he knows he's not going to win the game in feudal right no. he made a couple units he did the ability to disrupt the malian so now behind it he's going for the economy he's getting wheelbarrow he's getting forestry he's adding that second town center probably will eventually make his way to Castle Age to get King's Palace. And even though, you know, two town centers might not be able to compete with the cow boom and with the pit mines, I think three's got a good shot. Okay, oh, hear me out. The White Tower drop. If you still hold the position, you put, put it here. If not, you put it in the middle. Oh, that's a viable strategy as well. I, I mean, mean, I'm just saying it sounds kind of stupid, but why not? Sure. I mean, if you're going to put if you're going to put a white tower somewhere, definitely put it in the middle. You know, I mean, a, a, between those gold mines like these gold, the only thing that Puppy Paw is going to have is the passive gold income out of the pit mines at that point. You know, <laughs> he's only going to be exists. able to make two of them. 
And we do see as well Ram coming out here from Poppy Pot is going to be cleaning up the position. A really good position at Leenock and he's, he's actually think he's happy giving up this position right now because he's gotten what he wanted out of it. He's gotten the 2TC, he's gotten the economy lead. Yes, he's got a not gotten too many villager kills, but he's still happy with this. It's a lot of investment, but it's a good investment. It kind of surprises me that Lenox's actually continuing to make units right now. He made a couple of men at arms, made a couple of horsemen, which are heavy on the food category. Hasn't done a lot of farm transitioning for himself. While you see a lot of those villagers that were on berry bushes back there, English doesn't like berries either. They're more of a they're more of a bread kind of civilization than a berry civilization. But he's continuing to make horsemen, continuing to make men at arms, which are rather expensive. I think I might have. Uh, jump the gun in terms of castle age he's gonna hang out here for a little while yeah i mean i understand his investment into going horsemen right because you saw this huge mass of javelin throwers and you can't fight that with those arch like you can't fight it with longbows at all ever right because you need like i think it's five archers no sorry it's five javelin throwers to one shot a longbow and you need 13 longbows to one shot a javelin thrower so, you know, you don't need to be very good at math, but something doesn't math here. So he's going to yeah. have to make a couple of Javr Thors and then, or sorry, he can make a couple of horsemen and then he can start going into castle because he needs to be, or he is scared of this Javr Thor push. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of nice that, I mean, Lenok does have that scout on the western side of Puppy Paw's base. So he is seeing a little bit of what's going on. Puppy Paw does know that there's a longbowman mass and some horsemen. Now he knows that a stable is there. The scout will relay that information before his life is lost. So he does know a push is coming. Puppy Paw actually continuing with the Grand Fulani Corral, giving those cattle a little extra oomph, a little extra meat on their bones by getting up there. And I think just because of the fact that he has walls, just because of the fact that he made enough javelin throwers, it might be able to buy him the time he needs to stabilize. But we're going to see as those horsemen might get a good charge here. Well, to get a good charge on the ram, that's about it. It's going to get there. The, the horsemen should have a fun time with the javelin throwers, while the longbows on the other side should have a fun time with those villagers. Horseman's going to be taking a lot of damage, but doing a lot of damage here. Able to clean up a lot of those Javthors, taking them down. To those man at arms still hasn't really shown themselves too much. Just hitting that houses. And look at just the Jav mass of Puppy Paw as well. It's just melting. I Honestly, I think Leenok timed this perfectly. Um, I'm not entirely sure if he was able to scout the corral actually going down and getting built, but Puppy is scrounging he's trying to get his villagers not to die not doing a good job of that economic count now 55 to 36 gotta remember lee knock on that second town center as well the passive income is starting to get destroyed some of those houses are going down the puppy paw continuing to make only javelin throwers as of right now and lee knock will be able to get to castle age as soon as he hits that 1200 food he's only about 50 food away he's not making units anymore i think he did a lot of damage while the malians were getting up to castle age so that malian power spike in castle age is never gonna arrive oh yeah he, ma he made a proper dent in the Mali's economy right so uh, yeah of course still that cowboy behind that he hasn't done anything with but he's able to go up with that king's palace pretty far back as well surprised he doesn't actually go for the middle and secure his position a lot but I feel like he's actually this comfortable just going for it. Because usually, you're actually quite happy with this. Having his villagers inside for the battering ram to save them, actually. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But a lot of these villagers out here is going to be taken down by a couple of these archers. But they're just melting to the Javthor's man at arms out here as well. Linok now. Need to check in in the back of his base. Not too much of a uh, of a farm transition just yet. I'm surprised again that he hasn't gone and used his map pressure to go either side, right? Because there's so much food on either side. Well, he has the economic stabilization at this point where he can pump units, and he's continued to while going up to Castle Age. He has enough for his technologies, and it just seems like Puppy Paw on the back end. Yeah, he's continuing to make javelin throwers, but he's scrounging. 
for resources and a lot of these resources especially the gold where that pit mine is where that primary pit mine is it is in harm's way and continues to be it's not going anywhere so if Leenok can just continue to gain that economic lead you see he's got double the villagers all he has to do is basically keep doing what he's doing and he's going to end up winning the game eventually you know it's not going to be something that might end in the next minute or two but english they don't like winning games in a minute or two they like winning it in 30. yeah and i mean just look at this right it's it's, it's pretty rough in terms of economy count and the third town center is just going to significant like make it even more significant of course the cow's not going to be shown up there but just imagine plus 20, that's... But it's still not too good for Puppy Paw. And he's had to build so many of these houses again and again and again. It's like... The, the people that live there is just mad. It's just like, okay, this is the fourth time we're building our house again this year, Jim. Like, can we please just move? And it's like, no, we can't because this is my work. This is where I live. I need to live right next to where I work. And... And then the wife is just angry and you're just like sitting there mad and now you have like the army defending you. I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, but it's just annoying. But, yeah, know, to be honest, I'm not really sure how to reply to that. Yeah, statement. neither am I. Just um, don't worry about it. I, although I do know just because of the ruins around the other houses, the homeowner association is pissed. Oh yeah, 100%. At, le at least all of the houses are up to code, right? They're... They're sharing the same style, but the rubble's around. Like, he's cleaning up some of the bricks and... Wait, the Malians have chickens? Now, one thing to actually talk about the game. Uh, Puppy Paw is making some changes in RB composition. So, yes, he's adding, he's continuing to add javelin throwers. But we see our per first pieces of furniture hit the battlefield. We have mm -hmm. sofas of the veteran variety. And they will have that imported armor. It took a while to actually get here, but now that it's here, with that little bit of extra armor, which will help against things like longbowmen onslaughts, and will help also against men at arms that aren't necessarily the high DPS unit, which it looks like Leenok is starting to pump out. Yeah, slowly but surely, gonna be getting there as well, right? Gotta remember that imported armor on those sofas, plus two uh, on. Well, both of them is going to be able to actually take out these knights quite decently. And we see Puppy Paw make his first aggressive move this entire game. That is going to be moving out to the middle and trying to secure a point with his gold, big gold wins for himself. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's the Malian Empire, right? He needs more gold. Mansa Musa would be proud of this move at this point. Using his sofas to try to get some raids over there on the eastern side. Does see that second town center. Not sure if he scouted it or not, but does know of its existence nowadays. That farm transition, those are the English wheat fields that we've all come to hate. And he will try to get some raids over there, but there are knights chasing him, so it looks like he's going to have to back up, or he's going to lose some of that furniture. Now, Puppy Paw using that as a distraction technique while he's going up to the middle. And I oh, really like this legit. play from Puppy Paw. Because these villagers are going to go down from Leenok. Leenok was so focused on the sofas that were back in his base. Didn't focus on what was going on in the middle of the map. And lost a couple villagers frivolously for No. Him. No. No. So. Puppy Paw now securing his position in the middle. Has a decent army lead. But that could be very quickly transformed by Leenok into a pretty weak one because he has, you know, he's double up now in eco numbers, so looking pretty good as well. That sheep finally finding a home. But this push that could be coming out from Puppy Paw now onto Leenok's base there could be really scary. Yeah, I mean it's a really it's a really staggering and quite frankly frustrating thing for Puppy for Leenok because he killed a lot of Malian villagers. Right? He disrupted a lot of Malian economy, but because of the passiveness, he can be on 45 villagers and still have a 20 plus military lead. And you can see how much of an impact that that's going to be as of right now, pushing into the English base now in Castle Age English. This is their quote unquote weakest age. As we can see, Puppy Paw trying to take advantage of that. You see horsemen and knights from Lee Nock. He's trying to pump out men at arms as well. The javelin throwers do have a high enough base damage where they might be able to cut through a couple men-at-arms. Sofa's trying to make the front line 
Javelin throwers in the back, and it looks like just because of the knights that Leenok has, those sofas might end up getting carved up. Javelin throwers end up staying relatively preserved. Leenok having spearmen as well try to make those sofas back up, but as soon as that front line gets evaporated, as soon as those sofas start to go backward, those javelin throwers are as good as dead, and Leenok successfully Ooh. holding this from Puppy Paw. This was a point where Puppy Paw needed to make a lot of damage into the English base. He hasn't been able to crack it. That English turtle shell is so strong. And Lenox showing how strong it actually is. The Malian player has to back up. He does have control over the middle of this region, but I think because of the military count now stabilizing for both of these players, Puppy Paw at about 40, Lenox at about 35, he has the potential to continuously make more units, however. And I think Lenok will be able to slowly start matriculating his way south. Are you sure about that, though? Because no, Puppy no, I'm Paw not. pushing <laughs> back those sofas reinforcements has been joining in on the party here. Not a huge front line to tank up those sofas, so we'll be able to put some out here. Poison archers will be the next move for Puppy Paw. He's gathered up enough gold now in the middle, secured up this position. Can use this as a staging point. And Lenok now needs to find something. Has been making a mangonel for a little bit now, so we'll be popping out shortly. But the question is being able to defend it, because that is the real problem right now for him. He was fighting a lot of those fights underneath the influence of his own um, what is it called? Gosh darn it. The influence, that's what it's called at least. Yeah, he was fighting under his network, network of castles. castles. I don't Thank think you. He does, not, uh, he does not have a keep yet, so no network of citadels has been researched. However, that extra 20% makes a big difference in so many fights, and we say this over and over again no matter who we cast, is whenever you're taking a fight as an English, it better be near an outpost, or it better be near a keep or a town center or something like that, because that's the thing that wins you the game, yep. per se. And if you take a look at, for these players, I mean, we kind of ad nauseum talked about the economic count, and right now it's 120 to 51, but also look at the resources permitted out of both of these players. There is one player who happens to be in that late stage, that end game economy, where he's able to pump out greater than 2,000 food per minute. He's able to have enough gold to do things like endlessly produce the units that he needs to. There is one player that is not, and is sitting at a population of 115. I feel like for Puppy Paw, he is on some very thin ice right now. If he takes a bad fight, it could be the game. Yeah, but here's the issue though. I want, need to talk about this one. There's only a couple of hundred gold left in the base of Linux base, and after that he is dry and can only throw out trash. Needs to protect the mangonel that we talked about though. Archers is going to be on the front line here, but still some are going to slip by. He's going to get a huge shot off in the back before it is inevitable death. He's going to try to get up this castle. He's going to try to get up this keep, but I don't think he has enough military units to protect it. There's only archer spearmen. These sofas are wreaking havoc. Javelin throwers are here. Needs to protect them for the time being. Reinforcements are coming through here, but are is it going to be enough? Villagers running back now. Finally going to get that network of castles buff yet again. Is able to get a little bit of time here. Mangonel is still gonna be shooting. Still unprotected. The Mangonels are here. Jab throwers and archers shooting on a ke stone keep. So not doing too too much damage. And somehow Lenok is able to win the fights. The Sofars are dead with a crossbow keep. Still going up. It's still gonna get up too. So that means the middle is secured for Lenok and he can make more gold. And he taps out. Wow, what a beautiful fight from Lenok. I'm going to be honest, for the last like 30 to 45 seconds of this game, it was quite difficult to see who actually was going to tap out because I was just going to say for Lenok, he spent all of those horsemen to go around and get the siege all the way in the back, right? Mm. So I didn't think it was the best micro play, you know, because a lot of those horsemen got chewed up by the sofas, and then I think Puppy Paw's sofas overextended to try to get rid of that mangonel for the English player. So all of his sofas ended up going down. I, it was a crazy, you know, that last 30 seconds was an insane back and forth to the point where I did not know what the hell was going to happen. But now that I know that Puppy Paw has forfeited, it is a 1-0 lead for Lenok heading into game two and as we go back in the intermission screen hello everybody thank you for the ggs 
in chat. I'm sure Lenok appreciates it as well. We're going to be heading into game two in about a minute and a half. It's going to be on Dry Arabia. Lenok playing as the Malians. We're seeing a lot of Mali this uh, this day, actually, because so, we saw it in the series before. And Puppy Pop playing as the Mongols. We haven't we haven't really had time actually to talk about the uh, the, the draft itself here though because. Mongols actually got through for, for Linux, so he can play them if he feels like it, um, which is rather interesting, actually. But we can just go directly into the game. The timer, a little bit off air, don't worry about it. So we're already into the second game here. With that Malians or Mongols being played, pardon me. So let's just go straight on in. Malians, Mongols, what I want to see, by the way, is like 10 minute dark age done so spearman aggression man we are not skipping a beat there's no intermissions on this stream as far as i know puppy paw just to do our formal introductions puppy paw playing as the mongolian empire spawning in the north has a nice little ugu right next to his town center his opponent in this game number two lena playing as the malians in the color blue now for the Mongolian spawn, this is one of those civilizations, and even on a map like Dry Arabia, where the Mongols have a decent amount of RNG in terms of their spawn, just because of the fact that their town center is mobile, right? So he's got the Uvu next to him. However, not so much in the way of gold. That gold's at a, a pretty far distance. Don't hover over that. Don't do that. We're moving on. It's so bad. <laughs> It's so bad. <laughs> like it I know, I know what you were gonna say, and it starts with, "Oh, hear me out. I don't want to." <laughs> okay. It's so bad. Anyways, Dark Age aggression is gonna be starting at least for Puppy Paw, and uh, there will be a button here that you actually will be clicking, and it's actually worth clicking because why? Why? Why is this a thing? But. Uh, regardless, we do have that barracks coming up for Linok, and I am in a happy place right now because we see that Dark Age Donzo Spearman aggression that I absolutely love to see. Yeah, this is actually a pretty peculiar Dark Age Spearman matchup just because one of those civilizations don't necessarily have Spearman. They have Donzos. Now, Donzos, they do have a little bit more health, right? And they do have an extra melee armor, but they could not be churned out two at a time but as opposed to the mongolian spearmen so this is going to become a quality over quantity situation and malians they do have the home field advantage just because the mongols are going to try to be aggressive they're going to try to disrupt things like pit mines different other resource nodes so we'll see if lenok has the ability even though his donzos are a little bit more higher quality is it going to be enough to actually take down how many Mongolian spearmen there are. Yeah, and you got to think about the the fact that like, hey, they also have the ranged attack, right? Which is just, you can do it on a timer and you can potentially snipe one low or even take one, one spearman lower just to get them going. And we already have that home turf advantage just trickling in, right? Because that wolf playing on the side of Lenok is supposed to be neutral, but doing nine damage, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're in these dark age, hyper aggressive situations, every little bit matter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to be looking at the micro that the dark age spear fights have and how important it is, right? You have some Donzos or some spearmen that are low health. You got to pull them out. You got to get them out of harm's way to make sure they stay alive for the next fight. So with that little bit of health loss, even though, you know, it's just nine health, why are we talking about nine health for more than nine seconds? It could make an impact. You know, it's an extra Donzo throw. This is going to be something that Puppy Paw has got to keep in mind of, especially because you talked about the ranged attack for the Malians. It makes it so it's a little bit difficult for the Mongolians to actually get an outpost if they wanted to do things like have an out uh, tower rush in Dark Age. Mm. So we'll see if Lenok has enough Donzos to actually one hit a villager if puppy paw wants to go that route yeah surprisingly puppy paw i think he's kind of just like all right yeah that is linux is over oh linux is kind of over investing into donzos now he stopped at five i think that's a reasonable amount right he's seen now that these guys are on their way back but the main issue for me is he doesn't know if they're coming back 
due to that little scout mishap. He's still gonna be moving out, seeing if he can fight some himself. But Lenox is gonna be going up to the next age with that monster quarry. Following shortly with Puppy Paw on the silver tree here. Interesting silver tree. I don't necessarily think it's a bad option. I mean, he does have the trading post. If you take a look now that the silver tree is getting built, we'll take a look at the trading posts on the map. One is on the northern tip right next to Puppy Paw's town center. The other one next to Lenox. So he can't necessarily have a two route trade system where a lot of the times for if one route gets compromised for the silver tree, sometimes you'll just go to the other one. Doesn't necessarily have that ability to do that while in feudal age. But because of the amount of spearmen that he had, maybe he makes sure the Malians just stay in their own base. They're going to be working on their own passive income and doing those things. He can get trade going on in the back rather secretly because also Lenox Scout is not on the map anymore. Yeah, I feel like honestly at this point in the game, right, when you're playing against this Dark Age aggression where it's really, like, it's really, really critical with a lot of information. Do you invest in a second scout? from your town center. I mean, obviously he's up to the next age now, so he could be dropping a stable. He doesn't have the wood for it just yet, so he's still gonna be making a couple of Donso. Just going up to get some uh, proper Donso. I'll tell you what though, Puppy Paw getting some sweet, delicious raid bounty. Oh, yeah. Isn't he? With a couple of those houses, that's an extra 50 food and 50 gold right into that bank account and it's also getting Lenok a little bit agitated because he has to keep making houses at a time where he necessarily doesn't want to he wants to get production buildings he wants to uh, have enough wood for making more donzos or getting an upgrade or something like that so it's just being that little bit of a nuisance for him and i think now that there's a two to one in terms of spearmen to donzo i can i like the spearmen in this sh in this in this place oh yeah for sure i mean especially when we're not doing this dodging and weaving right we're not playing around the fact that these guys can throw a spear right you're going straight on hard on in just gotta be careful as well the, ca the con is still here so doing a little bit of tickling damage is important does matter you're gonna see that an archer, archer range is going up Still not playing around these Donsos that can throw their spears. They are a little bit funky at times. Lenok, still more information that trade is going to be happening behind all of this. It's not the longest trade route either, but it's still a little bit of gold. Eight gold per trick. It's not going to be too much that fun. Is, <laughs> that is not a lot of gold. No, it's not. <laughs> that eight gold, I mean, he's going to be moving that silver trade. You can see that landmark icon actually moving on the map on the northeastern side. So he will be moving. One thing that Puppy Paw has the benefit from, not only does that COD go down, another one gets re-elected in about two minutes. So he will have a nicely generated scout. Now he knows that archers are going to be coming out from Lenok. He's seen an archer already. Lenok does not know that Puppy Paw has archers in the works. He might be expecting something like Keshex because he's playing against the Mongols. So Malians, they're only making archers because they're trying to combat these spears. He's not making javelin throwers right now. Why would you? I mean, you can't make that. You can't make the. You can't make javelin throwers against us, right? So, it's definitely the smart choice here. A little bit of a couple of mind games and just playing around and knowing the fact that no, Lenok does not have information at all. And again, right? I would like to see him drop a stable. He has the wood for it, and I would like to see him go out and try to get some vision. Some warrior scouts could be definitely useful, and it's a great tool in the belt to deal with trade as well that again, he doesn't know about. But we did see an attempt here going out for the second pit mine. Did get up a pit mine and a house. That was taken out by a couple of archers. There was no that Puppy Paw has those archers, so could go for javelin throwers, which we do see as well. Yeah, I think a couple of javelin throwers might not be a bad idea. Now that he knows the archers are there, right? But now with that silver tree actually getting established over there on the eastern side, it means those traders are not just pulling in a trickle anymore. We could see the Mongolians build of old in a prior season where Keshiks did not exist. Because a lot of the times for the Mongolians before they had Keshiks, they kind of just wanted to skip feudal age yep. entirely. You know, they didn't have that feudal unit to really pack a punch. And it looks like for Puppy Puppy, he's not really trying to make it now. Right? So, 
for him, he gets the gold trickle of those traders, and now I'm seeing, just based on how many red dots are on the map, there's probably about five or six different traders that are, that are moving and having a good route, which is probably about 80-some, now that it's the majority of the map or the actual, you know, uh, length of one of the maps, if you want to take a look. 71 and 7 food, which is actually pretty good. So he can make a little bit of military units. He can make sure that the Malian player stays in his base. And then he can go up to castle pretty much unharmed and having an unharmed trade route. Yeah, and again, right, this is... Linux still doesn't know for all he knows, right? There's could be a... There could be... Um, what is it called again? Uh, there's stones and, you know, Linux does, doesn't know. He has no information. I mean, I, you would blindly assume with this pressure he goes... Uh, you would assume that you're Silver Tree, right? It would be dumb not to think that it's Silver Tree with his aggression. But you don't know. That's the issue. There's a lot of uncertainty, and he's playing a very thin line here, Linok. But, I was gonna see here, a second pit mine has been told outposted up. We'll have a little bit of a defensive tool here, trying to get back up out here as well. Has taken some deer, not something you often see from the Malians going out on pocket ecos like this, but sometimes. Desperate times calls for de desperate measures, but now this outpost is here, gonna be taking a fight here. Jab throwers, not too many, could be taking out the archers in the back here, need to be careful though. Kind of taking... Yeah, I think this was a surprisingly good fight for Puppy Paw, even though it was behind an outpost. Really? You're able to take a decent amount of Donzos out. You're able to... See, Puppy Paw's not necessarily trying to win the game right now. You know, Puppy Paw's just trying to make sure the Malians stay locked in their own base while he's getting his trade going. You know, he's he's taking out a little bit of that Malian mass, and even though he lost a little bit himself, he's still sticking around inside his base. There's no... any. I mean, the Malians have 8% of this map. Mongolians have the, other, have the rest of it. Yep. I mean, do you see that con... Just shooting out and knowing that, hey guys, shoot over the woodlands, will you? Needs to be very careful as well that we do see Keshek switch up coming out from Puppy Paw here. Jav throwers shooting over the wall with that extra range they have, getting a couple of archers. Doing pretty nicely with that. Cow Boom has been going on behind the, this as well. And I feel like the way for Linux to get back into this game is actually just going castle. It's, I feel like it's the only way he can properly do this, right? Because he needs to just do something. He can't just sit in his base and take the aggression that is coming his way. Well, exactly. I mean, now the, because of the fact that the Silver Tree exists, it feels like Linux on a timer, right? There's not enough passive income. I Personally, I don't think there's enough passive income to stop things like a full-blown trade route, no, right? No, so no. Puppy Paw is taking these little bit of skirmishes. Donzos are continuing to go down because they're backing up. There's not any other kind of front line. He doesn't have any kind of cavalry units just because of how many spears Puppy Paw has. So Lenok has to back up. Again, he's consistently being high in the military count. And now starting to add a couple Keshiks. You might think that's not the best idea just because of how many Donzos, but they are getting ripped apart. Ooh. There's only three or four of them, and most of them are almost dead. Most of them is already dead just because they're trying to chase down the Keshik so they can't get on top of the... A little sneaky jab throwers here, though Donzo's gonna be popping out of the outpost. Still a pretty good fight, though, for Linok. The jab throwers really showing their worth there. Khan just immediately pops because hello, jab throwers, with that base damage. And honestly, this is still fine for Puppy Pop because of the trade. I still think he has the time in his base to build up a new army to defend if Linok pushes out to attempt to take down the trade. Yeah, and I think if Linok did attempt to do that, it would be rather challenging just because of the fact of look at the units that he's making. All of them are not on horses, <laughs> you know? So the mobility, you do, you, you're you able to be at one particular part of the trade route, but it's not like you have horsemen or sofa or warrior scouts or any of that kind of stuff where you can just continue to go through traders left and right, you know? And you're able to just really devastate that route. You basically have to sit in one place and then when you're caught off balance, you're caught off guard, your mass just ends up getting devoured, right? So for Lenok, this is tough, you know, in terms of where to actually go from here. The only thing I will say is you've got to go out into the map at least a little bit. Yeah, and speaking of raiders, 306 raiders from Marine Lord coming on in. Welcome to the B-Stream, guys. 
thank you so much for tuning in on the B-Stream. We had a couple of games that was a little bit too good to pass on, so we fired up the good old B-Stream. And now we're watching Linux versus Puppy Paw. Earlier today, we watched Kill Jardy versus Recon. I'm not going to spoil the results, but gosh, damn, that was a good series. You have to rewatch. Yeah, I mean, these are pivotal series that are going to be played right now. Puppy Paw and Linux very, very close in contention to that playoff spot. And I think whoever ends up winning this game will have fate in their hands going in to round six as well. Puppy Paw with some good Kashik raids here. A couple Malian villagers going down. There's three total of the worker kill count for the Mongolians and we'll be adding a fourth Ooh. and a fifth and perhaps even more. But it's about the idle Save time. The cows. That's ha Save the cows. That's half of oh my god. Ah, uh, well that's a thousand food. You can... You should be... St okay, so... Usually that is really, really bad. But because the cattle ranch was already blueprinted, it's fine. It's fine. Because usually if you kill a cattle ranch and then you kill the cows that is inside of it, you can't kill... Like, you can't build a new cattle ranch unless you soak up a thousand food that's on the ground now. Yeah, and I think a little bit of soaking is what's going to happen. Lenok put a bunch of villagers over there and we'll be building that Fulani... Corral again giving those cows a little extra meat on their bones and it looks like puppy paws continuing to go in the feudal aggressive route he's now changing his composition he went away from spearmen just because of Lenox army composition going for more keshiks and adding archers as well and it looks like he's smelling some blood in the water and i'm thinking as soon as he gets the notification that Lenox went up to castle age we're gonna see a big fight I think there's I think there's a Quirrell tie coming soon, TM. <laughs> Having the superior mobility tech coming in, and now we have that notification. Kashik's already in position, gonna be trying and heading straight for the line as to where that cow boom used to be. Cow's already where it is. It's going to be really rough here. The army for Lenok, not it too much in position. Still getting those upgrades. It's gonna be quick here as well. And once again, he's gonna be killing the, the, the cattle ranch? Uh, the ranch will live oh, another oh. day. I, I, thought, I thought I saw the bounty get coming in for Puppy Paw, but it was the plus 21 of the food coming in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, the cattle ranch is going to live another day, and actually Puppy Paw, as soon as Lenok did hit the castle age, Puppy Paw sent all of his troops down south. It just didn't look like there was any good area for him to go in. The Donzos were already there, so the Kashiks necessarily couldn't get up and get a raid going. I'm interested in because he's continuing to make these units. To me, I would assume that he would be going up to castle, his trade route is established and all that kind of stuff. I'm surprised he's continuing to stay in feudal and make units. I, I mean, he, he's not necessarily right. He just needs to have these units on the front here. I mean, he has 44 archers with the curl tie coming up as well, superior mobility, raid bounty as well coming in. So he is ready to rumble or raid rather because this is going to be a really devastating push for poppy Paw. the curl tie of course will take some time to get to the front line but once it does i don't think lino can realistically hold this yeah i think it's going to be incredibly challenging and lino right now going through a sofa transition right and trying to get his imported armor also so basically with that curl tie getting completed by the time hopefully it gets down south in time for puppy Paw to take a good fight and we'll see if he has the ability to. It's so crazy because when you're looking at this matchup between Mongols and Malians, you look at the population difference. Puppy's at 160, the Lenox 100. But I don't necessarily say that either is out of this game. No, for sure not. I mean, again, right, we'll quickly check in. 27 traders, each of them, 7, 7, and 78. So pretty happy we have that curl time moving out as well. Lino's gonna try to see if he can sneak out here and get a little bit of something. But the main issue for me is he got to be so careful in moving into the curl tie, right? He's moving into a position, Puppy Pass full control over, and he has full knowledge. So he can place down the curl tie and take a fight at his own discretion. It needs to be so careful as well, especially when all of the army is completely out of position. There's nothing here. Reinforcements not going to be anywhere near for Lenok. And this is just a clean sweep. I don't think this is going to be even remotely close to this fight. No, this is the biggest, I mean, this is the biggest wipe that you're probably going to see. 
out of that series. Military count now 80 to 23 in favor of Puppy Paw. And now I think Lenok understands how big this trade route is for the Mongolians. He got he did take down a couple traders, which was nice, but he's not gonna get anywhere near actually taking down this trade route. And now with the Mo Mongolian mass. They do this, oh my god, it's since season zero they do this, where they just have these death ball of units. They usually add some siege in there as well, but there's this utter death ball of units that just makes its way towards your base. And man, there is nothing you could do about it. That wall is going to remain forever a blueprint. Yeah, I don't think it will be anywhere near. I mean, Kashik's going in on the wood lines here. Archer's shortly following, Curl Tie moving as well. Sofa's in the back trying to see if they can get something. There's not going to be a whole lot here. It's 37 military units against the 85 of Puppy Paw. And so, so much of that is Kashik's that Lenok realistically can't actually deal with. Villagers running around with their ha heads screaming and trying to figure out where should we go that is safe, but there's nowhere that is safe because here is the Mongol army raiding, doing everything. Kashyyyk's are here, bonus rain bout deep. Strong as well, no more gold for Puppy Paw, or sorry, for Lenok at all. And I don't know where you go from here, buddy. I really oh, don't know. I mean, you go to the, I mean, realistically, if I was Lenok and not playing in a tournament, I'd probably go to the next game because the curl tie it can sit and park itself wherever it wants to. You put those units by it, and there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, that curl tie is going to unpack a little bit over there. The sofa's doing a good job trying to pick off Mongolian resources, or reinforcements, excuse me. Curl tie not going to be able to unpack actually just yet, but all you need is that Mongolian force to make its way up north. They killed a lot of villagers, they were taking down a lot of buildings, but now it's time to take that main force on. Curl tie or otherwise does not matter. Kashyyyk's getting a good charge, their vampiristic effect going to be making that front line, taking down a decent amount of sofas. Donzos not quite into the fight when they needed to be. A lot of sofas went down before the Donzos went there. Javelin throwers have a nice little choke point in between this archery range and the blacksmith, so the Keshiks can't necessarily get a surround, but there's just too many of them. They're on both sides of the choke point, picking off those Javelin throwers one by one. The military count continues to drop down to about 16 before Lenok finally calls that game and ladies and gentlemen we are all tied up we're all tied up and we have a series on our hands i have to give a commands to lenok in that fight though the fact that the girl tie was never able to unpack i mean it was still a pretty rough fight admittedly but it could have been a lot rougher and just a little bit more demoralizing oh yeah i mean the curl tie could have made it an absolute destruction right but yep. curl tie or otherwise it was just the mass the Mongolian mass of units, you park it in front of the base, what are you going to do? You know. Now, uh, in this particular next game, mm -hmm. our game three with a 1-1 one, one tie, we're actually seeing this very nice change of pace from the first series because the first series we had four mirrors out of five games. This one, no mirrors whatsoever. It's going to be Abbasid versus Chinese on Lipany. It's the first Chinese game that we're seeing today. It's the first Chinese game. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean... I don't know. I, I th Chinese. I mean, Le Re Linux really likes playing the Chinese. I feel like. No, sorry, Puppy Paw really likes playing the Chinese. But honestly, we don't have to talk about anything because we're just going straight into the game. Oh my god! I didn't even. We we didn't even have to inter have intermission time. We didn't even need to look at your cat anymore. <laughs> we just we we just don't have the time for that. Game three coming in. Puppy Paw playing as the Chinese in the color red spawning in the northwestern part of the map. His opponent in this pivotal game three is Lenok playing as the Abbasid dynasty in the color blue. As you see over here, House of Wisdom going to be going down for him. Now, when you're playing against the Chinese, what wing are you thinking? I mean, I'm just going eco wing and going 3TC, and then they go 2TC song, and then you go 4TC, and they go 3TC, and now you go 5TC, and they go 4TC, and now you just have like 10TCs in the game, and you're kind of just going, what? Now, I do appreciate the counting lesson. And afterward, even in a few age, if you wanted to go military wing, I don't think it's a bad option either. You know, having those two spearmen and two archers while Chinese is trying to get their Song Dynasty underway. You know, they're trying to get stone for their second town center. Might not be a bad idea either. I know that military wing is rather the meta play for the Abyssin nowadays, but 
What's really nice about them, especially this season, is it's not like seasons of old where again you just hit economic wing and drag your face across the keyboard you can actually make it a strategic decision my cat was doing cat things uh yeah no it's like it's really different as well right because song dynasty has been changed a lot and it just it, it changes the matchup of the game as well but as you were saying right with going military wing against the chinese the reason I'm saying, like, yeah, eh, I don't know, it, it it just feels bad, because if they are unfortunate, you have a Barbican that you're suddenly now going, well, I just wasted a wing on nothing. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's a factor as well. I think when we are talking about different wings of the Abbasid Dynasty, I think we have to understand that it's not going to happen in a vacuum, right? It's not, Again, yeah. it's not like those uh, decisions of military wing versus economic wing are happening. You know, spawns are different, civilizations are different, all that kind of stuff. So it's nice to make that strategic decision. Lee not going for arguably the most phallic wing of the House of Wisdom is the economic wing, and hopefully we'll be able to pump out town centers as fast as humanly possible. Yeah, I would I would honestly be very surprised if Puppy Bot doesn't go to TC Song Dynasty here. It will definitely be a little bit slower than the 2TC from Abbasid, but will still be at least not too far behind in terms of economy. We'll have to see, of course, though. I mean, Lenok gathering up the stone, gonna get that fresh foodstuffs, as well as the uh, Fertile Crescent. And, well, there's the Barbican I was talking about, and yeah, if you want Military Wing, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, yeah. I, no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree with you at this Ooh. point. Um, the Barbican does work, oh. however, when it's built. And what I'm thinking is that he went for the Barbican initially, maybe because he was suspecting military wing. If he saw something like economic wing, which he did, as you can see, the perfect vision from Puppy Paw. He used the presence of mind to change his landmark and go for the Imperial Academy. Just one of those players that heads up decision making on a second by second basis so you got to give puppy paw credit yeah linok will be made aware of this though i mean the barbican was thought of and you can you can still place the barbican here right because it is a strong position place it further forward secure up the gold secure up the deer secure both gold in fact secure up stone but wait wait oh let's go Lena, come on. You put it uh, put it right in <laughs> Puppy Paw put it right in Lenox's face. I'm ready for it. Do it. Execute order. <laughs> now you gotta remember for the Barbican in this latest season, you can only put it so t so many tiles away from your opponent's starting town center. So you can't necessarily face Barbican anymore. You can kind of do a throat barbican or a neck barbican, and it looks like he's kind of doing that because the Abbasid Dynasty, he's going economic wing. He's going to want to get that second town center. You got to put it on a good food source. Even though you're getting fresh foodstuffs, you need a decent amount of food to pump out villagers and military production out of so many town centers. Putting that barbican there means that Lena cannot get that second town center in a good position if he's going to naked second town center. And Linux scouted a single villager moving out. He saw this one, he was crossing over. He's scared. Wait, Linux never scouted even his deers. He knows there's at least one deer patch here. So, I mean, by, uh, what is it called? Knowing that the deer is there at least. But my, oh my. Linux is in a really rough position here, it feels like. Yeah, I don't, and based on the vision that you so astutely pointed out, he doesn't know how much deer is actually over there. He also doesn't know that that Barbican exists over there. There's no vision in that particular area. So Second Town Center is not in a place where he necessarily wants it to be. It's right next to that wood line where he'd rather it be somewhere around food. And he's pushing Puffy Paw doing too. a good job of kiting these deer up to the north, making sure it's near that Barbican. Now... With Lee not going economic wing, right? And with him going to second town center, he's going to be focused from an economic standpoint. Are you thinking about Zugnu rushing? Um, it would be fun. I don't doubt that. 
Ish for me is you kind of just can't do enough damage in this position when you are puppy uh, when you're a puppy pop. Potentially now though, because now you see a 3TC coming out and now you could potentially, you know, just... I mean, you have a forward secured position. Might as well just drop an archery range and start having an archer. Not shooting a noose actually, but archers actually just sitting here and just being annoying as hell. Yeah, seeing that it makes you want to punish this, right? And this is mm. a very frustrating thing in the Age of Empires that we see now in late 2023, where we saw Kiljardi try to do this in our first series. He went 1TC French and tried to have some kind of feudal aggression, and it just wasn't there. He couldn't do it. So for Lee Nock, he feels like he can get this greed and actually pull it away. Now that scout finally going to see that Barbican. Puppy Paw sees that town center going to put that outpost down. Man, these Chinese villagers, they can pound <laughs> hammers faster than any villagers out there. That outpost is going to go up in a blink of an eye. And a big question for me is, will Lino commit to taking this town center? I mean, villagers will be jumping up and will be canceling the town center and needs to find somewhere else. Has at least another patch of berries that he can get himself some food from. But Lino... Despite having fresh foodstuffs, despite having cheaper villagers, he is hurting for food right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for Puppy Paw, this was straight up 100% great heads up thinking. This is this is one of the best barbican spots I've seen in some time. You have two deer patches. Not only are they two deer patches, but your opponent's, opponent's deer patches. patches. <laughs> and a boar right there. This is your food for the foreseeable future. And actually, Puppy Paw, if you scroll down just a little bit, he's just going to put his second town center there. Is anything going to stop him? I mean, a ramp push, but... Holy. Is he even going 3TC behind this? I think it might be. Oh, no, that's for uh, emplacements of upgrades. Never mind. Yeah, he did get the... I'm not sure if it was on the outpost. Yeah, I think it was on the outpost. He did get hand cannon slits for it. Now going to be getting some archery ranges. Man, this reminds me of Season 2 Roost, doesn't it? And I know I sound like an AoE boomer just because of talking about these past seasons over and over again. But he made... It's it's almost like how the Roost used to do where you put a second town center near the boar and you have your own little proxy base. You make yeah. a bunch of units and you go kill the guy. This really gives me that reminder. Ah, the good old days. Not really. Um... No, but it's it's so much right it's like it's oh, it's so much food here it's being taxed up as well you can drop off the tax you're fine with this you have a forward position dropping triple archer ranges wouldn't mind seeing a or probably seeing a blacksmith anytime soon here in the back as well gonna be dropping a ram i don't know Lenok. he doesn't know he doesn't know but i think that's for the better I, I, I don't see a way Lenok does anything about this, right? I mean, he does have his initial, his starting berry patch, if I, I'm looking at the map correctly, is dried up. I don't know if he has any sheep left in his town, town starting town center. It looks like he's got a couple of them. There are a couple berries over there, actually. And then there's that berry patch to the western side, and that's pretty much it. And I think Lenok knows he's going to be a little food starved later because he sees the archery ranges. He knows Zook knew are coming out. He's not making horsemen. I don't think he has the necessary food to do it. No. <laughs> I I don't know. It's just so rough right now. It seems... I mean, it's crazy to be like, okay, yeah, nothing has happened this game, right? There, there's been zero action, destroyed value, absolutely nothing, no villager kills, no nothing. But it's been such an aggressive game because despite all of that. Also, you don't need to kill those there like that. That is just like a little bit overkill. Yeah, there's definitely more arrow in de than deer in that deer. <laughs> but uh, with these archery ranges now, it seems like while he's massing up all of these Zugnu, it really feels like a Final Destination thing. You know, like we're 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 watching a train wreck that's going to happen to Lenok, and there's nothing we could do to stop it. I'm fine watching it. I mean, it sounds cynical, but I'm fine watching this train wreck hit. Now, it does look like Lenok does have a trick up his sleeve. He does have 1,200 food and about 450 gold. So he's thinking about going up to Castle Age and might be adding in some Ghulams. Um, I do see a couple barracks in there as well. So maybe he goes Ghulam, maybe he goes into the Military Lancer wing. strategy or something like that. 
going into military wing for the castle age as well again like we said in the first series watching the abyssid dynasty it's a minute 45 seconds whether you like it or not so it gives time for puppy paw to continue to mass up zugnu and he's going to get to a point where he's got enough zugnu that even if he does make a couple gulams they're never going to be massed enough to the point where it could stop a mass of Zugnu as big as Puppy Paw is. He is continuing this feudal aggression. There is no signs of stopping. He's adding multiple rams. That town center looks as good as dead. I'm getting hungry and I think so is Puppy Paw. And he's starting to chew through that town center. He's gonna have a town center and a uh, outpost here, but damn, the Zugnu is gonna be starting to tear through this town center as well. Still defensive position, 50 seconds away from that and still a little further away to go up to where well, we get those Ghoulams. And even if you have those Ghoulams, you don't have the plus one range to armor just yet. But these shooting Now this is, for Leenok, this is the longest 50 seconds of Oh yeah. <laughs> Waiting for the military wing to go up. He's down one town center now. Now he's two TCs, normal TCs against two TC songs. So even if Puppy Paw stopped the push here, I think that's enough damage, but there is no signs of stopping. That outpost is as good as dead as well. So, I mean, it's not too much to lost here, actually. I mean, you got three builder kills, but honestly, you're fine. Despite everything, you're fine giving up this town center, right? The main issue for me is now you're very cut off from your third town center, which is where you're getting your food from. Yeah, and that's exactly where he's going. Puppy Pod knows the town center's there, right? That's the place where you're going to go to take down the economic pro economic prowess of the Abbasid dynasty. Now, Military Wing did come in for Lenox, so you see a couple camel riders. They do have a lot of health, those camel riders, not so much in the way of ranged armor. So if they do get in harm's way out of those Zugnu, they're basically going to get chewed up. And we're going to see that happen very shortly. You see those camel riders going down at about half health, and now one whoop, is down. Whoop. Second one going to be going down rather quickly. Villagers trying to repair that town center. Not going to happen. Couple Ghoulams popping out. At 195 health, those Zugnu are only going to do one damage an arrow. So you're going to need a lot more Zugnu if you're going to try to take down those Ghoulams. I mean, you're still pretty fine with this trade, right? We see them not being target fired here, but still taking a whole lot of damage. More towers just creeping around. Just doing so much damage, containing uh, Lenok. As much as possible, Mangonel coming in as well from the Abbasid because they have that gosh darn stupid tech. But here we go as well. Puppy Paw going up to the next stage. Is that a four? Please don't tell me. Where, where, where is that? Okay, thank you. I was scared there for a second if that was a forward cock tower. <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, this is a good... This is actually a very good presence of mind from Puppy Paw as well. Because he sees Lee not going to Castle Age, he saw the Ghoulams, he's like, well, you know, he's probably going to mass Ghoulams. You see a lot of other players, maybe in the lower elos, that will beat their head against the wall in Feudal Age and continue to just make Zugnu. They'll make about 70 of them, it still doesn't matter just because of how, how many Ghoulams there are and they end up throwing the game because of that. Puppy Pot is not doing that. He's going to be adding a Clock Tower, which means he's going to be adding some very high-powered Siege to combat the seeds that Leenok is going to be making. You did see one Mangonel come in. We'll be getting a shot off. It looks like one Zugnu was the unlucky one and Cook took out about 80% of its health. Leenok trying to get a counter raid over here on the northern side. It looks like if he did get one or two villagers, it seems to be okay, but Puppy Pot is taking the economic lead now just because he is Song Dynasty. The Abbasid Dynasty is only one dynasty. They cannot change. Yeah, we kind of change it all. This forward position under a little bit of threat now. Shugnus, soon to be a veteran Shugnus as well. Doesn't have the plus two da damage just yet, so this Ghulam still not taking too, too much damage. Crossbow slowly but surely starting to build numbers as well here. But there's a huge mass in the back of Puppy Paw's base that he needs to join up with his main force right now. Unless he wants to be losing this entire forward base. He's put in a lot of investment, not only in terms of getting and securing up all the food, but also in just building units here and building just buildings here. So, Ram's now gonna be taking down these towers, gonna be securing a little bit of that. But he's also just not losing a couple of villagers here. Now, finally, that's a very peculiar hill that you need to go down, but hey, whatever works. 
I think one instance that was incredibly helpful for Puffy Paw as well were the outposts. I mean, I know they're going down by the Rams right now, but all of them were fortified, well, most of them, and they had their hand cannon slits with them. So, Linux Mass, it did have to push through where the Barbican and the outposts were, but they couldn't necessarily sit there and take down the outpost. They had to get out of harm's way, and it looks like Zugadu will finally be able to track those veteran archers down. I'm kind of thinking, though, now that the Rams are taking down the outpost, Lenok has defender's advantage, even though that's where Puppy's Town Center is. That proxy base might be gone. This proxy base is long, long gone. He gave up the position. He's gotten the value he needed out of it, but the issue is there's so much production building here that he can't and he hasn't built back up on. If you look in his base, there's a single Briarx, there's a single clock tower. That's it. That's the only thing that's in the back of Puppy Paw's base, and that's the only thing he can't lose right now. So... Puppy Paw needs to scramble. I feel like he shouldn't have given up this position. He's fine losing the town center as he... again. There's a village. I mean, all the food has been soaked up at least. Like that's that's a that's a positive thing. Here. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, if you take a look, we have four archery ranges from Puppy Paw right back into that proxy base, and that's one of the things that in those Roost games all the way back when, if you were able to take down the proxy base, you were able to take the game. I think this one might not end in a similar route just because Puppy Paw's economy is so strong at this point. He's able to remake those buildings if he needs to. Okay, okay. Now he's I gonna hear be you able say to have that. a crossbow mass. I hear you say that, but there is currently 38 villagers on a single deer patch. There is another 19 on another deer patch that will soon run out. And he hasn't even started making farms yet. Yeah, there is no granary transition, which is quite interesting. Now with four rams, for Lenok, that Barbican's going to be going down. Archery ranges will be going down as well. A lot of those reinforcements that Puppy Paw is trying to make are ending up just getting slaughtered because they're only one at a time. Those crossbowmen are trickling in. I was going to say, or I did say previously, that there was going to be a crossbow mass coming in. It looks like Puppy Paw isn't going to be able to mass them anyway. Yeah, it's going to be taking a couple of fights here. I'm just being able to take the reinforcements that's coming from his opponent's base. It's a really weird enforcement, but hey, he's able to take out a couple of them. Still a couple of raids here, just I linked more and more economy. Single outpost still being a little bit annoying on the side here. But the big issue is honestly the fact that a village might go down here, which could be really brutal for Puppy Puck, because he does not have the wood to rebuild a lot. Yeah, I mean, Linak, he did take a lot of economic damage while that Zugnu push was going on, but he was able to hold to the point where it wasn't too detrimental. You know, he did lose a town center, he didn't lose too much in the way of villagers, and we're watching the Abbasid power spike right now. I mean, he's got 100 villagers, he's going to be able to produce enough food per minute to continuously pump out Gulams and whatever other unit he has. He has military wings, so those archers have composite bows. It's very, very tough to stop the Abbasid dynasty at this point of the game. Yeah, and one of the big issues as well, we haven't really talked about it, it's like, okay, we, we've talked enough about the proxy base, but the units that came out of the proxy base while it was being taken down and immediately died is a huge resource sink for Puppy Paw that he's not going to be able to get back. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a reason why his military count is as low as it is. It's not exactly low, it's at 52, but it could be a lot higher at that point. But the long game now looks more and more evident. That village does go down, so Puppy Paw is actually capped in population. So we'll need to add another village to... Where? You know, with what <laughs> wood? With what wood? Right. Right. I mean, he will end up being able to get it eventually, or maybe just adding a couple houses. But for Lenok in that stabilization, we're going to see the post-imperial or imperial Abbasid dynasty if Puppy Paw lets it get to that point. And that's a whole other beast to tackle, too. And he has been able to stabilize, and with that stabilization as well, right? I feel like he's able to wall, but he, I feel like Puppy Paw, or sorry, I feel like Linok has actually been doing a better job at Puppy Paw with, the, with like less map pressure of just taking pocket resources. He's been able to take out one, two, three, four berry patches out of absolutely nowhere, and now we're taking a fight in the middle instead here. Ram's gonna be in the front line here. 
So we'll be taking out the mangonel at least. But so all those palace guards gonna be cleaned up. It's still just a wall mayhem just coming through here. Gulams getting through the wall before they're completely finished. Gonna be targeting straight down the alley, straight to those sneaky little berry patches. I still keep on jumping down here, even though I know there's an outpost. The this is one of the things that Linak is really, really good at too, and. This is when the Linoctopus really shines because he extends his tendrils out to different areas of pocket ecos that Puppy Paw has. More villagers go down because of that. Puppy Paw has to pull military units over here to make sure military other economic units for himself don't die. Now the lead for Linoc is 30 villagers at a time when we thought Linoc was going to fall behind because of all of that aggression in Feudal Age. Still no farm transition for Puppy Pie. He's relying on those berry patches, so those Gulams are getting extra tasty villager kills and continuing to. You're seeing the worker kill count down on the lower left-hand part of your screen. Now jump into the 30s for him. A lot of Zugnu are trying to take down those Gulams, and they're not going to be as effective. Composite bows now for these archers Ooh. taking down an IO. Nesta Bees with a big shot. Looks like about half health on a lot of those archers didn't necessarily go down. Another Nesta B oh. shot, that's just something you can't dodge. You know, he's trying to back up a little bit. The Nesta Bs are actually doing a good job taking care of Springholds in their own right. Now with one Nesta Bs left, there's a big Zug new mass, a big Archer mass that's about half health, so that's gonna get wiped up. Leenok is actually going to fall down in the military count. Puppy Paw taking the lead, but Leenok is going Imperial Age behind this. Yeah, going with the Culture Wing as well. Don't see Trader Wing really being realistic here unless we go to like 50, 60 minutes and somebody sent me a League Invite. Uh, let me close that client real quick. So, where we go from here? I think Leenok is in a really good position, right? I think he should have dropped... Yeah, he dropped another Town Center as well. So he was able to build himself back up a little bit more. Hope oh, people... Very shortly... I mean, I'm impressed he still has these original berries, but these are gone in not too long. He still hasn't made that farm transition that you need to do, which is a weak spot of the Chinese for sure, but we can see him actually just slowly but surely getting enough wood here now. I'm, I, I, We need to see a farm transition soon. Well, I mean, there's just never going to be the opportunity to do that. You know, you can't waste time trying to get all of that wood for the farm transition when you have an opponent who's going into... Those are some vil kills. Looks like Zugnu might mop up a lot of them. You're hearing a lot of Abbasid villager shrieks. Maybe this keep might not go up, but it looks like just with those horsemen, they might be able to try to take down those nest bees. They focus on the archers or the crossbowmen, I should say, instead. And that gives them just enough time for that keep to go up. Puppy Paw has to back out of there. Um, Culture wing soon coming up as well. Here is going to be Imperial and as so many units. Has he enough production behind this Linox to actually be able to use this though? He has about 17 production buildings that is available to be used and spent here as well. Remember he went culturing, so his research whenever he decides to go for this one. Why do you not get preservation on watch and then improve processing? I mean, I think Linox had a situation right now where his economy is set up for the late game. Yep. Puppy Paw is not. You know, you get to a point where we're 25 minutes into this game. You get to a point where both civilizations should probably be pop capped. And then it's about how you can continuously cap yourself with continuous military production. That is not something that Puppy Paw is set up for right now. So for me, unless Puppy Paw has a dramatic change in fights that he has, it's going to be a matter of time. And as a matter of time before Puppy Paw is going to realize that he is soon out of food as well. There's a couple of tears, there's a couple of berries. It's the only natural food left. And these knights are just going to be... He's still attacking these pocket resources. And there's still nothing for Puppy Paw to defend against them. There's units running around for sure, but it's just so much idle. Look at this. Look at the income per minute right now. There's, there's, there's nothing for Puppy Paw. Yes, he, he just doesn't have anything. Yeah, I mean, he's only at about 600 food per minute, and that's not enough to continuously produce units, where Leenok is sitting at about 2,000, and he will be able to do this over and over again. Now, Puppy Paw does have a little bit of a siege advantage here. Those nest of bees and those spring owns, I would imagine they're all of the clock tower variety. 
So it will be a little easy for him to do that. But Puffy Paw is continuously, he's just bleeding out on the table right now with all of these little pocket ecos just getting devoured by Lenok again those tendrils coming back and forth he does have a couple proxy stables over in the corner but this might be a big fight Lenok has those gulams in the front a lot of the zoo are making up those areas so gulams gonna be able to get free reign if they choose to but are gonna back up there's a nest of bees over there don't want to get stung by too many bees in that hive not too too many and I mean they're aggressive so they at least sting that's for sure Right, walls now going to be coming up and coming down. I think the, the what this comes down to is re, is replenishability too. Yep. Right, Puppy Paw does have the military lead, as you can see. It's 64 to 48. But when Puppy Paw loses this mass, and if Leenok keeps pushing the initiative, he'll end up losing the mass eventually just because of the sheer amount of units that Leenok can have. You get to a point where Puppy Paw is not going to be able to replenish this army once it's gone. But, but look at this. This is this is crucial. Like, this is crucial to Linux success. Three units here. Four units here. Six units here. Three units here. A keep drop over here. Poppy Paw is just overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Linux does this over and over again in games that I've casted for Linux. He just takes a couple units because he has the ability to replenish them anyway. You know, he just takes a couple units, throws them in different pocket ecos that he knows exists, creates the idle time. 70 villager kills right now. 70. Well, I mean, 72, 70, 70. There's a lot of 70 for Poppy Paw. And... I, I don't know. I, I just don't see it. I, I want to stay positive. I think Poppy Paw, I mean, he's doing a really good job of holding, but I just don't see him holding in the long run. No, it's going to be difficult going into yeah. Imperial Age, and I'm actually going to tell myself to shut up because this game is over. Puppy Paw calls it with about 59 to 60 villagers left. So game three, going to be going to Lenok in a pivotal game three. Now it's two to one in favor of Lenok. In game four, it's match point for him. It's match point for him, and, uh, well... I have to say as well here, though, it looked really rough there. Puppy Paw had a great position, but Lenok doing so damn well on pushing back on that, that proxy base. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> now I feel like usually the fourth game and the fourth map is on our screen. So I feel like we're caught up in this series. Yeah, I think we are. Um, finally, we're finally caught up to live. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And for all of you people who are joining in, whether it be in the middle of this series or last series, or if you've been watching since the beginning, appreciate y'all hanging out in the EGC TV B stream because that round number six it came up and there are so many pivotal series. We tried to open up that B stream for you guys once more. And this is our second series. We have a couple left that are yet to be decided in terms of what the matchups are, just because the Swiss rounds have to play out. We're waiting for the Puppy Paw Lenox series and some of other series that have yet to be concluded to make sure we get that round six going for you guys. So as much as I'd like to tell you who we're going to be broadcasting in round three and round four, or the uh, series three and series four, I'm not going to be able to because they don't know. We don't but know. But in this particular series, nobody knows. In this particular series, we are going to be on the holiest of islands Yet again, it's our second Holy Island game that we've seen so far in this stream, and it is an HRE mirror yet again. It's an HRE mirror, so it's a very holy day for us today. Um, I don't know. I feel like I feel like what we saw in the previous game, right, with uh, with Kiljardi and Recon. I feel like. It was very spicy, and I actually would kind of want to see it expanded more upon. I want to see the Dark Age aggression with those spears moving out, moving out on the map, taking down the dock, and making your opponent in a really uncomfortable position. Yeah, it was pretty interesting, the Kiljardi game against Recon in the series prior. He took a page out of the Mongolian book, you know, and made a barracks first instead of making the dock, right? He made a bunch of spearmen, he made sure he had more spearmen. 
then recon it, then he was able to take down the dock. This is one of those that plays, again, we talked about it in the last series when Holy Island came up. It plays a little bit of a cross between Boulder Bay and Golden Heights, but more so in the Golden Heights kind of category, if there's a spectrum to it, just because of the fact that you can interact with your other player's dock. You don't have to go all the way around the bay to do that. So yeah, being having that interactability just means you can pull maneuvers like that and really disrupt your opponent before you get your own naval economy and get your own fishing ships, and then you can kind of snowball after that. And we saw Kiljardi do that actually with the Burgrave Palace. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, well, for the people who didn't watch that game, watch that game. That was that was pretty wild. But yeah, I one thing I would like to see more of actually is just that because it's a really it's a really st- strange thing because you can't do that strategy on for example baltic you can't do it on boulder bay the same way because you have to walk so much further around and on baltic specifically and in very very rare cases on boulder bay or yeah on boulder bay on baltic your docks will be in emergency repair range and you can't do that then yeah that's a fair point as well i mean with Holy Island and the way the map is actually structured, the emergency repair is never going to happen, right? So the spearmen actually make an impact. That's a very good point. But now, with our overlay starting to be initiated, it's kind of an oxymoron, but we're initiating our overlay and going to put you on the holiest of islands for game number four. Here we have Puppy Pop playing as the Holy Roman Empire spawning in the northwest side of the map, playing as the color red, Lenok is his opponent, playing as a different province of the Holy Roman Empire, playing as the color blue. And it looks like Papa does have one villager going to that shoreline pretty much immediately, getting a decent amount of sheep there also. Lenok is doing the same in true mirror fashion down to the south, so there won't be any shenanigans for the time being. So, one thing that's a little bit weird, actually, is the fact that, I mean, we have, like, this, sometimes, I feel like there's two two Holy Island spawns, if that makes sense. There is the spawn of the woodlands being here, and you have, like, this narrow choke point, and then you have the other spawn where it's, like, your, your woodline is, you have a secondary woodline. So, we have to see, we have to see a little bit, I feel like... Lenok has a good Aachen placement here. And ah, Puppy Paw and Lenok has pretty similar spawns actually in terms of just like Aachen placements if you think about it. But the, the main issue for me is actually if you do put your Aachen placement in the front here, it will be much more susceptible to those man at arms raids. Yeah, and I mean it's super important on this map. Just because of the fact that you do have a dock, you're getting fishing boats, you're getting a navy. But make sure that Aachen is near a woodline whatever woodline you decide to be it and obviously there's better rocket placements than others but to get it near a woodline to make sure you're getting that economy going and you're getting as many ships as you possibly can out on the water because now without any kind of dark age shenanigans right we're going to see navies and feudal age butt heads against each other yeah there's things like micro that's super important you know there's things like lucky demo hits there's things like army compositions the rock paper scissors of the navy that we've come to grow and love at this point but it's all about if you can just make enough ships you're going to be able to steamroll against your enemy and if you don't have that awk placement by the wood line never going to happen yeah i that that's like a must like i don't know if you don't do that i mean you, you could go mine back just, I mean, I'm just throwing out the idea, Tim. I know you were an HRE fan, but no man mark. Could could no. be a rip. No, really. My response is no. Okay. <laughs> but what if? Also no. Okay. But what if? But what if? I. I that's no. That's also yeah. I'm gonna. Make yeah. You no yeah, on yeah, that yeah. one, okay. dude. Yeah. No, that's. I think that's reasonable. Anyways, we do see Lenok. He is very forward-thinking. The sheep here going to be on the correct side for the Aachen placements. The same can be said for Puppy Paw, although that's a little bit easier to do here. So we know where those will go. We do see the build orders being a little bit different already. Lenok already heading out over to the gold without a gold vein. So hopefully he remembers to place that one. 
Yeah, and it is kind of important, this build order, as we progress through Dark Age and we'll see the Aachen Chapels eventually. How many villagers you have on wood? Because it means not only constant fishing boat production, which you obviously need to get to feudal age, but when to add that second dock, as you see Puppy Paw doing that over there on the western side. And I know Lenok, it looks like there's a second one that's going to be built at around the same time. And it's actually pretty staggering how mirror-like this mirror actually is. Yeah, it's quite impressive. I, know, I mean, I know Holy Island is basically made with a center line with all the relics, right? So it's somewhat a mirror ma uh, mirrored map, but as you said, this is incredibly mirrored. And we oh, we do have one less wood for Puppy Paw. Oh. So maybe not an entirely mirror, but I'm glad you pointed out the Holy Island spawn itself because we tarp on the water. You know, we talk about getting our fishing economies and all that kind of stuff. But one of the reasons why this is also a good HRE map is the amount of relics that are actually on the map in this small area. In this small island, there's five relics there, and they're always evenly split, with that sixth one being on the other side where that second sacred site is. So when you are able to win water in Feudal Age, and you get up to Castle Age, and you get those relics, there's no stopping you. Yeah, and it's really, it's it happens sometimes, it's a little bit odd, which is... I don't know, as we've now started, or I've started a little bit with map scripting, uh, you know where you're going to decide? Okay, there we go. Uh, I don't know, relics are sometimes weird, and this map a little bit weirder too, right? Because you have that sixth relic, which sometimes spawns here and sometimes doesn't. And it's just, you know, if you get it, it's it's really tough to get it, right? We saw in the Recon game, if there was a relic on the Holy Island, there there actually was a reasonable time to actually get that relic. But oftentimes, more times than not, you actually don't see it being picked up. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the times you're focused when you're when you're on the water like that, you're not worried about spending the resources to make a transport ship, yeah. right? And to actually get a prelate over there to get that relic. You're not really thinking about that. You're just thinking about making sure you have the commanding force of the seas. Yeah, I think I think sometimes what people over, uh, often underestimate is like, okay, you have one water, right? Just like take 10, 15 villagers, take them in transport ship and just take full control because there's 16,000 gold here and a sacred site that your opponent will effectively never be able to take back. No, I mean, it's going to be difficult for you to do that. And another reason why on this map water is so good, right? Because that's, that's just an indirect benefit. Now, Puppy Paw going a little bit different in the macro variety and actually has eight villagers on gold maybe a little bit more than doing things like getting hulk production and demo production however perhaps 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 a little sneaky barracks is going to be there i mean it's not going to be spotted out by leenok but he could potentially notice that something is a little bit off here but there's also going to be a little bit of a water fight there quick check in before the fight starts ensuing here. 14 fishing ships for Puppy Paw for Lenok. 13. So a little bit to fight over there. We have that barracks coming out as well for Lenok. Has been scouted, presumably. But those men at arms for Puppy Paw will have a little bit of an extra time. And it will be coming straight forward that forward a wood line that we were talking about. Yeah, I mean, for both of these guys, both Leenok and Puppy Pod, they have pretty raidable areas. You know, their wood lines are forward in pretty much identical fashion, and their gold resource is also forward. So, really good idea for both of these guys to get some men-at-arms with the extra food resources that they're getting from their fishing boats to actually go in and try to get some raids, do a little bit of damage. Yeah, and, I mean, in terms of water battles, I mean, again, right, they're so passive. They're kind of just chilling at home and just being... Yep, this is going to be a land fight, and if one of us decides to go for a water fight, then our APM will be there, and you're just kind of going to be in a little bit of a rough position. Speaking of a little bit of a rough position, this prelate is going to be shouting, and he's going to be dead even. That's actually pretty important, isn't yeah, it? That's... Leenok has to actually make a prelate out of his town center. The Aachen Chapel doesn't have a prelate. It has a megaphone, but it doesn't have a prelate to shout its prayers. So these villagers for Lenok are going to be uninspired, not producing as well as Puppy Paw's villagers are. 
What does that mean? More military for Puppy Paw. Yep. And with the tower going up as well. I mean, it's nice having that defensive, but it basically tells Puppy Paw that, hey, I'm Leonok and I'm a little bit scared of these raids coming in. Yeah, I mean, you'd also want to use that wood somewhere else. You know, you'd want to spend it on doing things like getting a navy and harassing your opponent's fishing economy. Instead, you're building an outpost, right? Leenok is actually not doing much in the way of navy production or any kind of military ships, and he's floating wood as a result. He still has the macro operating like he's going to make ships. He just doesn't. And I don't see a way... Right, I don't see a way for Lino Care if he ever scouts this out. I mean, he's gonna have a no sh moment whenever these guys show up. Well, when they do show up, it's gonna be too late, right? Lino only has one galley and one Hulk. Puppy Paw has four Hulks, two galleys, two demos, barreling down this holy sea over here on the south side. He's just looking for some fishing boats to take, and it's gonna go rather unopposed. I don't think there's going to be a lot of a battle here. He has a Springle ship in queue, but that, I, that, that's just not enough. I mean, this is the proper crucial moment. I mean, he's going to try to do something here, but it's just overwhelmed. Yeah, I mean, that demo shit, it is going to get a good hit on that Hulk. Now, Lenok has absolutely zero military ships. And as soon as I say that one Hulk pops out of that Eastern dock, one Hulk isn't going to be enough to save you. And then Lenox suddenly, we're going to notice for Lenox, his men-at-arms production is going to halt. When we talked about it, it was about 13, 14 fishing ships. All clumped up in a single spot now. I've seen this one before. Luckily, the script has changed since last time. But Lenox is pushing back on land. However, the big issue here is the fact that he does not have the food to sustain this at all. Right, and I mean, a little bit of that is obviously just because of the fishing ships, but look at what he has to do now as you panned over to that starting town center. He has to take sheep with those villagers. And what does that mean for Puppy Paw? It means he can spend villagers doing other things. He doesn't necessarily need to get them on food. Now, what's nice for him is because he won water, this is kind of the age-old trope of a lot of the higher ELO players, is once you win water, you stay in feudal, you win the water, then you go up. And that's look, and that's what's looking like Puppy Paw is trying to do. While well, he's continuing to have 30-some-odd workers on food and has a lot on gold as well. He already has enough men-at-arms. He can keep Lenok back in his base, and if Puppy Paw chooses to go up to Castle, which it looks like he is doing, the relics are right for the taking. Burger or Regnitz? Um, that's a that's a good question. Also, I think because the because he has the fishing economy, I think he could do either or. I mean, Regnitz for later in the game, but for Puppy Paw, he might be able to snowball this into mm. it. Lenok not going to be able to dodge those. One demo going down by the arrows. Enough hulks to take down the second one. All Puppy Paw needs to do is to park those hulks right next to those docks, and there is nothing Lenok can do about it. And okay. Yeah, Ragnar's gonna be the choice for Puppy Pop. Never mind. Yes, it is. <laughs> but I think Lee don't care. He is perpetually stuck in feudal. I don't think there's an ever a way to catch up to him. He's just completely yeah, gone I mean, off of no... the water. And I mean, he could. He does have the opportunity to go castle. I mean, obviously he can, and he is actually has to spend his wood in doing a farm economy instead of the water. But it looks like he's macroing to get Castle Age, which is fine. He's just never going to be able to pump out the same amount of units that Puppy Paw can. I mean, do you do a Panic Burger drop? Or do you actually go Regnant's Arrow? I think it's tough to say because you don't have the map control. Of course, now Puppy Paw has only one Prelate, so he has to move that on the map. But I... <clears throat> I don't know, this is going to be really rough, and yeah, that's... Honestly, that's a solid choice Yeah, by Lee Nock. I'll give him that one. Uh, that was that was a game that it was going to be nigh impossible to come back from just because of that loss in the water, but that's sometimes that's what happens on Holy Island. You know, I think the main pivotal moment 
was the lack of military from Lee Knock on the Sea. Hmm. You know, he had right. he had one galley, he had one Hulk. That was pretty much it. I mean, yeah, that was, that was it, right? You were just like. I feel like Alinok almost forgot about water because he was like, ah, Puppy Pie is not attacking me. I have some ships here. I'm fine. I can sit back and cozy up, but... Then you don't have the sc scouting information and you kind of you kind of have that one moment where it's like, ah, schmuck. And that's a really easy thing to do because while you're worried about men-at-arms that are near your Aachen Chapel, those men-at-arms are trying to take down your wood villagers, you're not necessarily thinking about what's going on in the water when you got trouble on land. Yeah. You know, that's what happens on Holy Island over and over again, and we saw that in the first game, where you might have good stability on water, and your fishing economy is doing okay, but on land, you're suffering. Or it's the other one. You know, for Lee just in that game, I think the reason why it closed out so early is because it was both for him. But this one... Now we have our match tied up at 2-2. Two to two. We have our second straight Game 5 coming at you. Phrygian Marshes. I'm so glad they saved this one for last. I'm so excited to see Phrygian Marshes. And one of my favorite matchups to cast and one of my least favorite to play. <laughs> it is a French mirror on Phrygian Marshes. I'm hyped for this one. Oh, yeah. Um... I feel like there's just going to be knights, knights, TCs, and then some knights, and then maybe a little bit of a sprinkle of some spearmen, and that's about it, to be honest. Yeah, you know, I see a lot of times in French Mirror going for more of a knight spear kind of play, just because the knights are as powerful of a unit. But I have a really good question in chat by Lena Lionheart. Is there a way to win this map by ignoring water? By this map, I'm assuming you're saying Holy Island. Yep. And my answer is going to be no. Um, at the high level of play, definitely no. Um, and the reason why is because of how powerful docks are. <laughs> docks act as a second town center 45 seconds into the game. Yeah. It's... You're down, you're, you're going to be, if you don't go to water and you don't make those fishing boats, that means you have your villagers on land having to gather food. Your opponent doesn't. So they can spend more on wood, they can spend more on gold, getting the things they need to do while still having the food to back up while you don't. So, it, I mean, yeah, it's possible, you know? I mean, I've casted enough low elo games in low elo legends for Rising Empires to see that happen. But in the long, but in the long term, and especially if you want to grow as a player, work on your hybrid build because you will win games Oh yeah, when going on water. But... We're going to be talking about Holy Island no more in this pivotal game five. This is a winner. Wins the match. Puppy Pop playing as the French in the color red spawning in the south tip of the marshes of Frisia. And their opponent, Lenoch, spawning in as the French playing the color blue spawning in the eastern tip of this area. So French mirror, right? Usually the first four minutes, first four to five minutes, relatively calm. They're just kind of like, you know what? Why don't you just, why don't you just leave me alone for a couple minutes? I'll get my school of cavalry. I'll talk to you at about the five minute mark. We'll have some, we'll have some night jousts. It'll be great. What is my cat doing? <laughs> Astute observation. Thank you, Cal. Sorry. The, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and usually at about the. That's okay. Usually at the four to five minute mark, you get the School of Calvary, you get your first knight out. Usually that means that when the Royal Knights are going to be coming in, it matters where those knight battles are actually taking place. Whether it's in your near your town center or your opponent's town center, because that means if it's near your opponent's, you might be able to create a little bit of villager idle time where you're safe back home. Yeah, and the thing is as well, right? It's like the idle time in a French mirror snowballs so hard it's absolutely crazy it's like okay you you missed out on i don't know 10 seconds of gold okay now you're for 10 seconds you're gonna be down a night and for the 10 seconds you're down the night you're now gonna not be able to take a fight while your opponent is and so now you're just like now you're losing 10 more seconds of gold time and it's like okay now you're 20 seconds behind knights and it's just like okay suddenly your opponent has three more knights than you even though you've been constantly producing knights as much as possible but because of that small idle time you're now the game's just done yeah to be honest i mean cal you kind of hit the nail on the head 
about this matchup and how pivotal something like 10 seconds is. And I'm going to use the same analogy when playing as the French as I've done for the past two years now that Cal probably because we've casted previously together, you're sick of it. But for the French, it's all about creating an avalanche. And how do you do that? You have to pack the snow correctly to make your first snowball to actually roll down the hill and create that avalanche. If you're not packing the snow well, like doing things like getting nights at a correct time, you're not 10 seconds behind. You're always in constant production. And if you're going for that second town center, making sure you have the economy backup to continuously produce nights, not only out of your school of cavalry, but out of multiple stables. If so, if you're not packing that snow, you're not creating the snowball that turns into an avalanche, you're basically just going to be a puddle of water. Yep, and a very sad puddle of water at that point because this game matters so, so much. And that one mistake and packing the snow wrong, you don't want to make that mistake today. But it's, yeah, uh, I mean, the frustrating part of that, too, is you might not necessarily know you're doing it. <laughs> and you don't realize that five or six minutes in the game, especially in a mirror like this where it's so pivotal, because you're going to pack the snow better than your opponent. So if you don't do it correctly, your game is just 15 minutes long of agony. Yep. One thing that is uh, very interesting, though, in a French mirror like this, it's you will often see the player that is dominating the most go for the second town center lost like or sorry first pardon me like you will most likely see a couple of knights being dropped like two three knights contain your opponent as much as possible and then go a town center behind it yeah i actually i noticed that pretty frequently and i've come to say i've lost games doing that you know where you feel like well you can get your second town center up it's not that big of a deal you make your one or two knights like you usually do or that old divine build that we remember you do the two knights quick into second town center if you do that obviously you're stopping your knight production by doing that so mm. you're w when you go for the second town center first before Ooh. packing your snow it means you're never going to get there right for usually you stick on one town center you have a stable or two you're continuing to make knights spearmen if you want to and you're continuing to put pressure on and then when you're able to create idle time, when you're able to create pressure where all of the battles are going to your opponent's base, that's when you add the town center. Yeah, and here is something really interesting, though, because I think Poppy has that town center thought about a long, long, long time ago. Because he's getting specialized pick, which means he will be able to get... There's a shorter window. Wow. There's a shorter window where he's exposed and less producing like because he will be shorter on the stone and will be quicker back on the gold so well i'll tell you what that specialized pick is better than a generalized pick that's for sure increasing that by 15 percent. and you're exactly right i mean this does help for the gold production right yep but it's also going to help if he does want to go to town center right so both of these are or both of these players are going to be playing on one town center as of right now leenock now what's is pivotal too leenock did get his school of cavalry up first so that means Knights, his first Knight came out a little bit before Puppy Pot. And I know you might be thinking that this is minutia, but it's actually pretty big. Scout from Leenock actually gets saved. Scouts are very, very important in this French mirror because if you have your Scout alive along with your Knights, it means you're going to be able to see where things like Spearmen are. You're going to be able to see where Villagers are that you can pick off. So keeping that Scout alive is crucial. Yeah. And one of the important things as well is that the health of these knights are super, super important. So we will see in these knight mirrors, uh, even in French and or well, just general knight sieves, uh, French and Ruse, they will often have their scout be tanking up the initial damage. And we can see the snowballing start here. He's just tanking it up because the snowball does not want to start for Poppy or for Lenok. He was tanking it up. Villagers did not flinch. They're still mining their stone. Yeah, that's actually, I'm very, very glad you pointed that out because that's a very cr critical micro that both of these players are doing. Scout tanks the charge. You have the scout take the charge because they're the ones that can recuperate. I mean, obviously mm. with the French, you get chivalry a little bit later in the game, but look at what Lenox's doing now, just kind of like what we talked about. A lot of the fights are going on at Puppy Paw's base. Puppy Paw can't go out and get stone. He feels like he's on the back foot, even though theoretically he's not. He still has, you know, just about the same amount of knights and actually one more knight than yes. Leenok does. But because those fights are happening at Puppy Paw's base, Leenok can go back and get stone and never have to worry about getting raided. 
Yep, first night g does go down though. It's just gonna be a quick pick, gets the scout as well, and then starts running around, so... Equal numbers in the fight for the time being, but health is where you gotta be important to look at. At some point, either of these players wants to be dropping in at the uh, chivalry, get those... Re uh, get the health region back up, but just getting in a couple of charges and that's about it. It's gonna be falling back here though, nine villagers here, trying to soak up the stone as quickly as possible. My cat's doing cat things. And think about where Lenok is choosing to gather that stone. He's not going for his home stone. So to Puppy Paw, he might be thinking, well, he's not going for stone at all. He's not going to be going for that town center. So now that he's going for that secondary stone, he might not ever even scout this. No, why, why would you? I mean, hello? I'm, I'm, I'm against the French. Why would you take out a far out resource? It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. However... He's gonna be scouting that mining camp and he's gonna realize that something is up. Gonna be taking a charge here though. It's gonna be in favor of, of Lenok, however, though. Look at this, the one night HP. This can be dangerous. Look at where Le what Puppy Paws uh -oh. Knights are going. They're uh -oh. going up to the north town center uh -oh. trying to get there. They had to cancel it. There's eight or nine villagers over Run. here that have nowhere to go. They gotta Run. come back. They need their night saviors. Yeah, well, there's not going to be too, too many of them. First villager is not even dead yet. Wait, what? The charges, they went all over the place. But what do you yeah, save is like the question. With a charge here from Puppy Paw could be brutal. Do you kill, do you save a villager or do you save a knight is the question. Scout's going to be the thing that is going to be tried to be the sacrifice. However, will not die as Scout. Still alive here is going to be taking this fight. Still looking kind of solid for this puppy paw. Still behind this, though. Still hasn't gone for that second town center we were so heavily expecting. No, and another knight did go down for puppy paw, but still has the knight lead. There's a difference in that. Lenok is going for chivalry right now. Just queued up another knight, so he's going to be forever fighting in a knight deficit if puppy paw continues to make them. As soon as other knights end up popping out. So that second town center, instead of Lee not going on that food source, which is so pivotal for French, is because those knights are just so expensive. Uh -oh, Means uh -oh, it's gotta uh -oh, go by the wood line, which is not good. Bad micro out of that knight. It was very difficult when you have multiple groups of knights and you have lower health ones that you gotta pull out of harm's way. It's so difficult to make sure all of your knights don't die. So that charge, that one second that you had to pull that knight back, it means minus 240 resources worth of army value. Yeah. As well as well, Lenok right now is fighting against two stables from Puppy Paw. He's going to be running and evacuating away from the gold. No more safe gold has one all the way out here in the far back that it can't realistically take. Going to be adding in a couple of spearmen, but I feel like in a French mirror like this, when you had to start adding in the spearmen, that's when you know you're in the gutter. All right. And Puppy Paw, because of that, Ooh, Lenok got a little ooh. greedy with that town center. He established dominance. Before you finish your point, count... Puppy Paw has had... I forgot about this. Puppy Paw has had his blacksmith for so much longer as well. Yeah, that is important. Just that extra plus one. You might not think it's a big difference when knights pack a punch the way it is. But it could mean one less hit. It could mean one knight doesn't end up at one HP and gets to heal. Maybe it ends up going down or four HP or whatever the case. Maybe now Lenok is on the back foot because of that greedy second town center play. So he has to make a barracks, has to make Spearman. Puppy Paw on the other side. Look at where that second town center is from Puppy Paw. Right up north by that shoreline fish, and Lena can't do a damn thing about it. And there is so much food there. Ten shoreline fish, deer pack, his stone. He's in a very happy position here, and he knows there is no reason or way that Lena is going to see this unless, unless, unless... Oh, Puppy Paw. I thought he was going to try to finish oh. that town center. I think he would have been able to. Safe approach, though. No villagers were harmed in the making of that town center. And now that it finally goes up with a villager count lead in favor of Puppy Paw, 44 to 42, those knights are getting chased out to the northwest. That town center and those villagers safe to pump out vills. Yeah, and you're just gonna you're just gonna try to make these guys full HP. Some knights will split off, try to cut off their escape point, because these guys are just super, super dead at this point almost. It's gonna try to run around, see if it can cause some idle time by these spearmen that's gonna be sneaking in. Could be doing a little bit of interesting damage here on the gold stop and halter the the uh, knight production for a bit. 
but we were talking about this earlier and we're seeing it unfold. The initial snowball, five seconds of idle time, it spiraled into now having a six, uh, six night lead. Yeah, and I mean that's and that's like and that's a thousand resources combined of food and gold of different knights that are out there. Really like what Leenock tried to do there on the south side with the spearman that you panned over to. Spearmen actually, when you're playing in a French mirror, aren't the worst in terms of a raiding unit because if your opponent just has knights, what are you gonna send over there to protect your villagers? It's just gonna end up being knights, and you can't really do that either. Puppy Pop making a little bit of an army change because he sees how many spearmen Leenock have. Now he has 14 and continuously pumping them. Puppy Pop is going to be adding an archer mass. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting choice to go into an archer mass. Sometimes, I mean, there's a lot of people have a lot of opinions on French mares like this when you should add spears. I, for the longest time, just was like, if you only make knights in a French mirror, you kind of just win. But... We are here now, Spearman's gonna be chilling out on this position in a pocket resource where villagers gathering up and a lot of them too. Spearman gonna be splitting up, Knight's gonna be seeing if he can get out and well for the time being as well. Yeah, this is, I mean, Leenok is kind of doing this out of desperation, right? There's no food back near his base anymore. He might have a couple, you know, berry bushes or whatever, but they're gonna get absorbed soon. So he sends a lot of them out for those shoreline fish, and especially because Puppy Pot getting them, and a huge charge. Looks like we got a little bit of a joust out of Puppy Pot and Leenok. There are more knights in here from Puppy Pot, but Spearman finally catch up, taking down one of those knights. It makes Puppy Pot have to back up. That's one of the great things about Ooh, using do, 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 Spearman in a matchup like this, but the fact that they're not mobile, just like you're making good sound effects out of those Spearmen. The pathing was miserable by the Spearmen, but it makes it so, just because of the fact that they're not mobile, Puppy Pop was still able to take a little bit of a fight against knights and then back up. Take a little bit of a fight against those knights and then back up. Which is probably what they would have done if the spearmen weren't there anyway. Yeah, the reason I was a little bit scared there was that could have been really bad if Puppy Pop committed a little bit more to the fight. It would have been in a really rough position when he came to that and could have lost a lot more knights than he did. Spearman, though, was barely getting in on those charges. Got a couple of pokes off, but that was enough for Leenok to still have a pretty decent fight there. And we do talk about that. It's just archers building at home. It's kind of chilling up and getting a decent mass. And when the clash comes, Leenok will be none the wiser as to where those archers came from. However, he's going to try to get in a couple of night charges here. Could potentially see this. Not sure where his scout is. All the way in the back of his base because he made a new one. Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> the villagers are caught at that secondary gold mine. That is a difficult place. I mean, he does have walls over there, but it is a rather forward resource node. Now with all of those archers, see how Puppy Paw hid how many archers he had until, or the fact that he was making archers, until he had about 13 to 15 there, because that's the mass you need to start taking down spearmen rather quickly. If you only have five or six archers in a fight, it's not going to do you any good. So he saved it, and now Leenok knows that he has archers that might constitute him to make his own archers, or maybe do more, you know, raiding or back off on the spearman production a little bit. I honestly think that in a French mirror like this, like my new my new thought that I've had for a little bit now is like the one making the archers in a French mirror like this is kind of a little bit doomed, because like your archers are just so so weak against these knights. However, it's not over just yet, French. Knights still pretty strong, sealing, healing back up. Here's these guys, and look at Puppy Pot now, going up with that Royal Institute. He needs to be a lot careful here now. 49 people, 49 villagers on food. None on gold so far. 25 villagers trying to get this Royal Institute up, however... One of my biggest problems with going this route is the fact that, hey, it's going to be really hard now to immediately use the Royal Institute. Because you got to remember, you get some really, really expensive text. Royal Bloodlines, 490 gold. The same for the Arbolatria upgrade. It's super expensive, and that's why oftentimes you actually see French people age up with, uh, age up with their food res uh, villagers or wood villagers. Because now, it's going to take some time before you're able to get this blo Royal Bloodlines, especially when Linoc... It's hardcore pushing you. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, Cal, because 
He was at 24 gold when he started to build that. So now it takes Ooh. him a little bit, even to just get the 125 to go up for veteran Royal Knight status. Lena doing the opposite of a mirror and going with, instead of the Royal Institute, could be going up with the Guild Hall. He expects this to be a longer game, first off. And second off, he wants to take this game to Imperial where that Guild Hall actually pays off. Could do. I mean, one thing you often see for people who build um, build guild halls, right? It's like, okay, he'll probably put this immediately onto stone. Just wait a little bit and be able to drop a keep between his um, between his uh, production buildings. However, one thing that is worth noting that you often see people do, and I think that Linux has done the same. Not really, actually. You actually often see people building their buildings like this and be able to drop a keep in the middle between them. Let's see, this is where we have a difference of strategies for both of these players, right? Just because of the difference in landmarks that they chose. Puppy Paw wants to end the game in Castle. That's why that's when Royal Institute's a good landmark. It's not that great in Imperial, because Lenoc would have the same technologies at that point, right? That's when the actual power spike for the French is going to happen. And usually for the Royal Institute, and when you're getting Royal Bloodlines, you get that big huge power spike and that's when your snowball turns into an avalanche right that's the exclamation point at the end of the game Lenok is thinking something completely different and you can tell based on his army composition as well because those spearmen more of a defensive unit right so if the spearmen he's got 33 of them he's making sure those food villagers are pretty safe you can't really go out and do anything with them especially because puppy paw has archers now so puppy paw continuing to try to do things like make knights, royal bloodlines in the queue, making arbs as well, which I think arbs is a fantastic choice, especially in Castle Age. And we're going to see probably in about a minute or two, once that royal bloodlines tech actually comes in, Puppy Pie has got to take the fight to him. Yeah, and ironically though, Arb Latrius is just an absolutely cracked unit. It's it's so insane, especially with the, with the royal institute. Gambeson, I mean, it's pretty good. You get that one in Castle as well. Anyways, but the crossbow stirrups, my goodness gracious, 25 attack speed. People are just like, oh yeah, the Tau Victory and the Matter buff is pretty strong. Okay, plus 10 extra attack speed on these guys, and they don't even need to be near anything. Right, and then you put, and then you get a melee unit to go and try to take out those Arbaletriae. Guess what? You're hitting a, <laughs> you're hitting a stone wall because <laughs> of those Gambesons. That plus five melee armor, oh my god, you need a decent amount of horsemen and an absolute complete surround. Can't use ranged units either because of the Pavis shield. So those Arbaletriate, they they pack such a good DPS punch, but they're also so tanky too. So it's frustrating to deal with when you're up against a French player who has an Arb mass to the point where you probably need Siege to deal with it. And I think Puppy Paw's gonna get to that point where Siege is gonna need to be necessary. French transitioning to a Siege workshop, they're not really worried about too much wood. Ooh, now Puppy Paw trying to get a raid over here on this north side, Spearman, just because they're on foot, not going to be able to chase them down too, too much. Puppy Paw might be able to get a villager if they stop. So oh, we are could even get more than that. Passing. Quick wall, quick wall, quick wall, quick wall. <gasps> no, 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 no. Is there a way out for Puppy Paw? Is there a way out for Puppy Paw? He needs to fight his way through this. Knights on the right here. So he's going to lose a bunch of knights. Those spearmen is going to be getting on, cleaning up the rest of these knights. Still alive is going to be sneaking their way out, but a couple of the French opponents' knights is still going to mean. Oh my gosh, it's still in a little bit of a sneaky position. Has the scout with his army, so spots out there's a bunch of ranged units there. But my goodness gracious, puppy. Uh, you know, like, I get. I get that I'm a caster and I'm not supposed to be speechless, but I was very speechless oh. from that play. Now, big fight taken up. All of these spearmen are going to be able to come out. They're taking shots at the Arbaletriae, not really doing much. They're really trying to focus on those Royal Bloodline Knights. I think Puppy Paw, this might not be a fight that he necessarily wants to take, but Royal Bloodlines, we're going to see how strong it ends up being. It's 18 Knights to 25 right now. Arbaletriae still hanging in strong, but Puppy Paw's got to back up. His military mass is suffering. Lenok is ahead on that military count, 54 to 34. Puppy Paw's going to be backing up, backing up, backing up to that town center. Hopefully he has a keep back here to try to give himself a little bit of defensive prowess because he's got a massive ball of spearmen and knights. Luckily there is a keep over there that's going to help him out just a little bit. But just because of the mass and the pocket ecos that French loves to be in. You see those pocket ecos from Puppy Paw. He's got some wood over there on that side. He's going over to different shoreline fish. Lenok is licking his chops. I, I, I can hear just Lenok just sitting here going. 
Because mm -hmm, he's going to be getting in some good raids. Does not have his scout with him, so a lot of these secret, secret guys is just sneaking by and just thinking, oh no, there's a little bit of going on here, but trickling units coming here. A lot of spears, though, is going to spot, the spearman is going to spot so, so many. Linux, are you paying attention there, buddy? Don't run too far away, all of the pocket ego is going to be found. However, a little bit of a Uno reverse card is going to be met here, though. Now it's Linux that's in the very very bad position here though spearman gonna take a huge good fight here against all of these knights still not enough though to take a lot of them out yeah, it really shows how tanky those royal bloodline knights are because you heard all of those braces that were hit and those knights over there by the north side though looks like they're gonna find some of those shoreline villagers a lot of villagers end up going down looks like one or two actually Knights of not Royal Bloodline variety for Lena going up against Puppy Paws Knights. There are a couple, two or three Knights trying to take home some of those villagers. And by taking home, I mean their corpses. Some of them more go down. Lena at 28 total worker kills throughout the game. Puppy Paw only at seven. Had a really nice cleanup here. However, there are a lot of Knights that went down. There are a lot of Spearmen that went down. It looks like they're not even going to try to take any more villagers. They're just trying to get the hell out of here. They not care though, not producing any more units. Looks like it wants to go for imp. Has started queuing up a veteran horseman here. L knows that that is the co answer to these Arbor Tree. Yeah, but even then, it's still so brutal to do so. Keep coming up on the front side here. Start protecting a good large stone vein as well as the sacred side. However, I'm not too sure if that is enough because he just lost so, so much army destruction value equal however the amount of units that left on the field is completely different red palace now coming up at a very peculiar spot i would Ooh, have to uh -oh. say yeah i mean honestly cow this is puppy paws time you know this military count is 55 to 8 you're never going to get a better military lead at this point in the game and even though he's down a little bit on villagers this is his time where he needs 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 to strike and take down some villagers but that red palace is going up with 31 villagers over there on the north side gonna help to get some of that food resource up there which is gonna be crucial in imperial age obviously but puppy paw he's still he's trying to take down this wall he's looking for any kind of villagers to raid and kill he's just coming up dry red palace is up now Probably going to see some upgrades coming in from Lenox, and if Lenox is able to hold for most likely the next minute and a half, I don't see a good win condition for Puppy Paw. I mean, he's going key, uh, he's going Imperial himself, right? He has so many Arbitrias here on the front line, some that still could be rallied in, so he's still a little bit fine here. Has a pretty huge safety net to go up to key, uh, to up, go up to Imperial himself, but other than that, I am not too sure how this is going to go. Puppy Paw is going to try to find a couple of raids, but there's a town center, there's a keep, there's everywhere, and these darn Arbolet Tree emplacements is so brutal. Red Palace now going to go up a little bit further forward as a staging point to take down a, the proxy base that Linux has. Yeah, that's a quite interesting Red Palace placement now that you put it there. I don't think it has range on that other keep, but it's a good idea to meet him in Imperial, but now we're at a point... We're now that we're an Imperial on both sides, we're 25 to 26 minutes into the game. That Royal Institute it doesn't look very good anymore, does it? I, th I still think it does. I I'm sorry, I still think it does look really, really good because you got three upgrades that mattered. And it can give you the option in the Imperial Age here to actually have cemented your position. But this is looking a little bit rough though because there's so many horsemen here. Yeah, horsemen getting this surround, particularly on the east side for those Arboletriae. Those horsemen spears are pretty much the only thing that can carve through the gambesons of French Arboletriae. And boy, did they do a good job of that, that mass. And the one thing about Arboletriae is they are a little bit slow. They are very, very powerful horsemen. They're imperial horsemen. Those Arboletriae are a good DPS unit. But man, if they get caught off guard, they have nowhere to go. Puffy Paws military mass is starting to exsanguinate as we can see military count 37 to 20 in favor of Linux. and for a while the pendulum of the tempo was so long in Linux's favor it then swung back to puppy paws and now it is standing still in the middle not sure whether it should go back to Linux or it should go to puppy parts so equal Linux though with that guild hall as we talked about 
Has in the long run a little bit of a better. He did collect about 1,500 food at some point. Switch it over to gold now. Neither player's going for trade just yet. Something I would like to see and something that is really easy to do on this map as well. Because there's always corner trade. Yeah, and trade actually might be the safest option as we get to about the half hour mark. They're almost there. Because as you can see, all of those gold villagers, it looked like the entire, uh, the entire French province was trying to mine that gold. Has to migrate their way south and idle just a little bit. These gold placements now are in harm's way. There's a trebuchet actually behind that red palace. Going to be taking shots at that keep. And it looks like Leenok, as far as siege goes, he does have rams, he does have a cannon. But that's pretty much it. Now Puppypaw trying to get some of these horsemen out of here. Because for Puppypaw, looking at scanning the map, looking at the mini-map on the south side, on the west side, everything that he has walled in, I don't see a gold mine. <sighs> nope, I don't I don't either. Really don't either. I mean the only gold income they will probably have in the short term now is actually the relics, which you know, it's not the best late game gold income unless you're the HRE. Other than that, it's only trade and shortly, shortly we need to see that trade being started. French trade as well, realistically very, very strong. Has that upgrade as well with the merchant guilds. It's actually a really, really strong upgrade, I feel like. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it depends on how many traders you have too. Right, if you have a massive amount of traders, obviously you're going to get some good gold payout. But Puppy Pot trying to stabilize his gold income just a little bit better. You know, instead of that 4k gold mine, might not be worth having a keep down. This 8k gold mine absolutely puts a keep down mining camp right after it. So his gold's going to be safe for a little bit. Both of these players are now population captain. It looks like on the south side, we're trying to raid that gold mine area. Lenok knows pivotal against the French to take down the gold that they have. Now it's gonna be rather difficult. There is a red palace keep fit with the Arbaletrier little uh, Arbaletrier stand out there. And that will be taking down any kind of horsemen like, that try to raid. Like even the palisade gate is just dying. Like this, this, look at how much damage it's taking. It's absolutely crazy. Linok though, has been able to break through here. The keep on their pockets here has been gone down for Linok as well, so. Leenok has gone through the wall, however, he's not going to find too, too much because everything is just all over the place. Trade has been added in for Puppypuff, 70 gold. Has the same been added for Leenok? No, it hasn't. I do want to say for this, though, what an incredible series. Oh, this yeah. is game five. We're tied at two to two. Economic count, military count, neck and neck with one another. Both players have a stockpile. Both players are pop capped. There is no clear advantage point you know for either of these players like this is going to come down to some raiding some trade routes there might not be that one big battle that constitutes the end of everything but my god in this french mirror in this pivotal game five i can't ask for a better display out of both these guys this is i mean it's an absolute incredible people in twitch that's spamming f i hope not only a tiny f all right. Was... All right, fine. <laughs> I mean, as long as it's not a capital F, I guess. I mean, as long as it's not the three uh, three downtime streams we had on uh, mainstream. That's, uh, that's all I can say. Anyways, trying to raid is so bad, right? It's so horrible because of these Arbalist emplacements. Quick check-in on this gate. It's almost dead. Yeah, that gate will end up going down but it looks like there is a ram over there trying to take down that keep on the western side all those units actually end up getting cleaned up there's a cannon was over there i could have swore i saw a i cannon mean there back was there <laughs> there was is the key word i guess keep trying to get repaired to the best of the ability this is super super important that Leenok is able to do because puppy paws trying to get his trade route under control he's trying to build his markets get his trade route and he needs gold in the interim and Puppy Pot and Leenok are going to be fighting over this 8k gold mine, which might be a pivotal point in this series. Yeah, it's going to be super rough as well, right? Gold here, Leenok. It's your trade, buddy. I'm starting to get scared. Sacred sites are being captured middle. There's still a lot of action we've actually missed out on. A couple of trebuchets are out there. We're going to be trying to target down another keep from Leenok, but got to remember as well. He has this guild hall, he still hasn't cashed in a thousand eight hundred gold. Could have been a thousand eight hundred stone as well. 
that's not gonna be the option. It looks like for both of these military compositions, it looks like with the count a little bit in favor of Puppy Pop for Siege, they're going more in the way of Trebs, which obviously you should for the Red Palace emplacements, but now Puppy Pop actually has some stabilization of his gold, now raking in about 12 a minute had some knights in to try to take down Trebs. Lenok just going for a horseman and spears, whereas Puppy Paw, on the other hand, going for Arbs. I have to say, I really think Arbs, just because of how powerful they are, they're such a superior unit. I feel like in Imperial Age for French, you'd be making a mistake if you weren't making Arbs. Oh, yeah. So you're saying that Lenok is making a mistake. I did not say that. <laughs> one, can, <laughs> one can be inferred. But I did not say that. Lee not going in the way of the Arbaletria counter in the form of Horseman, which might be beneficial to him as well. So one thing that I do want to talk about while we're doing things like trading, like Puppy Pie is to stabilize gold, one thing that you also have to stabilize is wood, which is over there on the western side of the map as well. Those Arbaletria trying to get some raids on a couple villagers. Looks like one vill goes down, a couple horsemen. They are at a critical mass to one-tap a lot of these horsemen. It looks like Puppy Pie is trying to kite and do that but it's going to be particularly difficult with no front line. This is his military mass is made up entirely of Arbaletrier. And if he's able to surround, and it looks like he's able to do that, Lenok pumping out horsemen right next to this Arbaletrier mass. I th actually, they're going to survive this. They're actually going to be able to do so. Most of these villagers on the side there has actually been cleaned up. Sitting at 85 villagers now, 100 villas kills in total this, so far this game. Mangonels has actually been added by Linok as well now. We're starting to see the game just go into complete chaos where neither player actually knows what's going on. How many traders are we up to? Only six traders, just slowly trickling them in. Guild yeah, I think sitting. for trade, I mean, you're going to be using it more of a... A tactic when you don't have safe gold, yep. right? So you're going to be trying to focus on doing that. Puppy Paw's actually doing okay in the gold route. That gold mine, no one's getting. He does have a safe 8k gold mine in the middle. Does have a good map presence and able to take those sacred sites as well. So Puppy Paw, now he's pushing the initiative. That Arbaletrier mass, even though there's no front line, they're tanky enough as it is. <laughs> they are its front line. <laughs> right. We saw Horsemen and Spearmen get a surround on them, and it just didn't matter. So now he's going to be able to push with this RB Letrier ball. All of the keeps, all of the defensive structures are down because of the trebuchets. Mangano's got to turn around. We got to see them get their rocks off. Here we go. Big mango Ooh. shots. Puppy Paw in that staggered position. Only a couple RB Letrier actually ended up going down. Horseman can't get us around because of the staggering. We have Horseman from Puppy Paw making that roundabout, trying to take down those mangonels. One goes down, which is going to be beneficial. That second one looks like it's going to be preserved. Get a good mango shot. Three or four end up going down. However, with those horsemen coming in for Puppy Paw, all they need to do is that little bit of wraparound. He's got to stop those rocks from hitting his Arbaletri. Yeah, and look at the economy as well now. Puppy Paw has no food to replenish. There's Lenok, not to say, struggling a little bit more, has more food income. But I just want to look at this. 3,200 gold has been collected from the guild all switched over to food. Knows that's where his big struggle is. Farm still not the same, has a lot of wood. He is just trying to do here now Arbletria. We were talking about them so so much. Look at how much damage they do. Plus seven. <laughs> They've got a total of ten melee armor. What the actual? Ten. Ten melee armor. A, a the horse. The only thing that can has really combat them is the horseman. A knight because, has like, how much? It, it's absolutely unbelievable. And just because of the mass and the sheer mass that Puppy Paw is continuing to make, there's 44 Arbaletria out of the battlefield. He's continuously pumping them out. Lenok is now outside of that population cap. We talk about it in post-Imperial over and over again. It's not about the units that you have. It's the ability to cap yourself over and over again and make sure you're taking those skills. Now, one thing that Rarebud actually Ooh. said in chat for Arbaletria, make sure you're using the Pavi shields. If you're looking at one of the Arbaletria, if you can click on one of those, Cal, I would appreciate that very much. That Pavi shield gives you plus five ranged armor. So Pavi shields are helpful if they're Arbaletria that Lenok was having. But because of Puppy Pop being the only ranged mass here, not really using the Pavi shields doesn't really need to. I mean, you still get a plus one ranged. Like, you still get plus one ranged. Ooh. 
It's a little bit unfortunate here, though. I think there's more villagers for... Yeah, I think this keep will go up. Nothing you can do about that, Leonok. It's gonna be trying to relocate here, see if there's any more gold. Still not in... Pr or still no trade behind this, but I feel like we're starting to see the beginning of the end here. Leonok is just heavily under pressure. Nothing you can do about it, realistically speaking, here. He doesn't have the food income right now. Actually, he has a lot of food. Never mind. It's Puppy Paw who doesn't have the food to actually replenish this if he loses this. Yeah, but he's doing a lot in terms of breaking down Lenox's economy. I mean, those farm fields have to be vacated. And those villagers are idle moving up to the northwest. This is the death ball now for Puppy Paw because of how many Arboletriae they're there. He's trying to stop that keep. Probably not going to happen. But there is a more immediate danger. And that's back home. There's horsemen, there's Arboletriae. He's not going to be able to do anything about it. Lenox's population at 151 Puppy Paw continuing to be capped. Oh, those Arboletriae, we can see them just seeing how much damage they do. Rams trying to see if they can finally take down this keep. Or I shouldn't even say finally, it's been taken down once more. It's been taken up now. We have a cannon out there for Puppy Paw is looking to take out the guild hall. It's already been collected most of it, only 740 food. Leenok would like to collect before he goes down, but I'm not too sure if he's able to. However, the map is now split in two for Leenok. Economy on one side, production on the other. Yeah, I mean, now without this guild hall... <laughs> you know, I talked about in Imperial Age, that Royal Institute not looking too good, but that guild hall ain't looking that good either. Now that it doesn't exist anymore, it's quite difficult. That keep finally going down from Puppy Paw on the western side. Got to remember, while all of this battle is going on, all of these buildings are getting torched down. Puppy Paw still in the sacred victory control. He's got about five minutes, 45 seconds, and a lot of the times, the best defense is a good offense. And that's exactly what Puppy Paw is doing over on the eastern side, and he's going to go down just a little bit more south, and he's going to find more villagers. He's going to find more horsemen all of these units that the Arboletriae are just going to mow down again. Again and again and again and again and again and again. That's all we feel like. And look at this! The first goal, the stone that was once was Lenox is now being taken by Puppy Paw here. Though Lenox is taking a decent fight here. He's going to be looking to see if he can do something. Keep's going to go up though. He's going to be cancelled immediately as he realizes that that is not a winning fight you can take. But look at these Arboletriae, they're just standing here and they're just vibing. They're just vibing. You know, I mean, Leenok did a good job of pulling, making Puppy Paw kite back up so reinforcements up north can try to take them out. But I want to, just because it's been about 10 or 15 seconds, can we go back to that Arboletriae mask? Yeah, it's still alive, <laughs> actually. How many units went down? How much army value did it take? to clear about 30 to 35 Arboletriae with the direct counter astounding with the direct counter yeah it's abs it's absolutely astounding now with that keep coming up remember that is a red palace keep it's going to be difficult for Lee not to actually traverse this area and although he might try he's going to be rather unsuccessful so puppy pot did a really good job of just carving a dagger right in the middle of his opponent's base with Guildhall being down, a lot of buildings ended up being down. Now Guildhall is actually back repaired. A lot of villagers had the ability to do that. Relics but on the ground as well. Because he carved that path over to the eastern side, Lenok has been so focused on trying to get his home situated, the sacred sites are continuing to tick. They're tick, tick, ticking away. Sacred sites, three minutes, four minutes now. We have seen the guild hall is back alive now. It's gonna start ticking in and giving that food again. I am so yeah, so scared for... now for Lenok. Yeah, I know for Lenok that guild hall can't be quick enough just because of how much food that he is devoid of. Population still being at 180 is continuing to do pretty much the same units. I mean, he's continuing to go with horsemen. He's continuing to go with spearmen, adding some veteran knights as well. But a puppy paw continuing to press that initiative over there on the eastern side. Leenok trying to raid his way back into the game a little bit on the south side. Very difficult to do that for a French player, especially an Imperial, just because of the Red Palace upgrade. You can see those horsemen getting devoured. I mean, there's nothing in his unit. There's nothing in his buildings, right? And they're just gone. They're just gone. But 
That's not gonna be the important part here. I feel like it's gonna be the fact that the base of Lino can shambles. Red Pal is being targeted down as well by a couple of trebuchets. Yeah, and it looks like those trebuchets will make good work out of that red palace if no reinforcement from Leenok is going to be coming to help. It looks like Leenok is trying to mass up to have some one last push over towards one of these sacred sites. They are pretty defense up, and it looks like Leenok... <laughs> I wish this was a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. but 42 I mean... minutes into the game, he's going to be starting to wall up that trade route. Only about six to eight traders throughout the duration of the game. Anyway, another fight coming in. There's another Arboletrier mass. It's behind a keep now. That keep not going to be able to get built over there on the south side, but that northern keep providing a benefit, especially because it is of the Red Palace variety. Arbs are continuing to kite back and back. You got to remember for those knights that are there, they do get hit with bonus damage, even though they do have more health. So a lot of them just get completely wiped out and for how expensive they are before you knew it there was a cavalry match surrounding those arboletriae and uh for about the seventh time this game now there's not and again and again and again these arboletriae they're just there they're just like so they're so good all we can say but look at the food economy for puppy parts absolutely non-existent right now but the same can be said for Lenox. however Lenox is a couple of units down here as well it's going to be able to clean up those trebuchets that was targeting them down it's trying to contest the sacred side with a couple of rams it's going to be taken out to this keep as well those won't be long lived again our blade our emplacement with that red palace gonna see if we can get something here though but Lenox. i don't know your main base here it's your town center under fire or on fire, I should be saying. Guild Hall dead. Your or your Guild Hall uh -oh. is alive. Your Red Palace is dead. Your Fire Miko soon to be dead as well. A minute thirty seconds remaining on the clock. And now it's continuing to tick down. Around a minute twenty seconds. A lot of villagers end up going down here. Puppy Paw is actually losing villagers as well. Now we're down below the triple digits of economic count out of both sides. They know that Puppy Pod knows anyway that there's probably about a minute left of this game. It's probably, if there aren't villagers, you better be able to kill some off just to make sure you have enough military. He's got 88 Arboletriae on the field. Lenok has 66 Ooh. units total. <laughs> they get a surround over there on the Arboletriae, which is fine, but it's not near a sacred site. It's not near a sacred site whatsoever. Still trying to contest it with a couple of rams. There's no... There's a couple of uh, villagers out there that could run to protect it. Hopefully they will soon though. But this Arbletree is still alive. I don't understand. Why do you have 8 ranged armor? I don't understand. Or sorry, why do you have 8 armor? Even Puppy Boss stealing away the relics that once was the, the property of Leonok. And Sacred oh, now Sites. Now we actually have a mass trying to decap that Sacred Site. Looks like a lot of spearmen are over here. They're trying to make sure that those rams go down. At least Puppy Paws villagers are. Looks like villagers are will be doing a little bit of a run around just to make sure. Rams. But the Arboletrier mass comes protect. in. Rams are here to like protect they will the be in here side. just in time. Sacred Site will stop ticking for the time being, but not for long because the units of Linux will shortly be gone. That's for sure. Take ticking away. Unless they're not. Was changed a while back here. Sacred Sides are gonna be going up again. The time starts ticking and Linux taps out. Puppy Paw manages to win the series. What an unbelievable game. And what an unbelievable series. This was without a doubt, I want to say, probably the best best of five series that I have watched in some time. Like, it was outstanding.